This presentation is designed to provide you with the background information on movement system impairment syndromes and to clarify the underlying concepts and principles as well as to provide a few insights into the classification schemes. This material has been developed by numerous people as you can see from these lists of names. We, each participant has a specialty in a specific body region and they have contributed to the clarification and support evidence of all of these concepts and we also have a great deal of research that's going on particularly as it pertains to the low back under the development of Linda Van Dillen and we've also been working with uh, Paula Ludwig from the University of Minnesota on the clarification and evidence of our shoulder syndromes. There are two textbooks that contain much of this information, one written in 2001 uh, that is currently under revision. After 15 years, we're happy to say that we have a lot more clarity and, and thanks to Linda, as well as to Paula, more evidence behind the concepts and the classifications. The other book that was published in 2010 contains the body regions that were not in the previous text. You also should be aware that there are videos that uh, demonstrate the exams for all of the body regions covered in the uh, second text except for those of the hand and those interested in hand problems will find this a very detailed and complete chapter all in itself. We are now moving into a very exciting era for physical therapy. The American Physical Therapy has adopted a new vision statement which speaks to our contribution to the healthcare of society. We are going to optimize, transform society by optimizing movement to enhance the human experience. Along with the adoption of this new vision statement, the American Physical Therapy Association also developed some guidelines to uh, clarify the implementation of this vision. And one of those is an identity for physical therapy. And that identity is the movement system and for physical therapy specifically the human movement system. And I think this will really clarify that this is our system of expertise and that we are the professionals that can best shape the development understand the dysfunctions, make the diagnosis of the dysfunctions, and develop treatment programs, as you will see as we begin to explain how this system can be uh, implemented in physical therapy. At Washington University, we've been working on the concept of the movement system for a good number of years, and we have developed this figure diagram to represent the human movement system. Uh, the sort of larger outer circle represents the musculoskeletal the main effector of the system along with the nervous system which you can also consider a regulator of movement. In the center as it is almost anatomically positioned are the pulmonary endocrine and cardiovascular systems. Clearly these systems are necessary for the viability of the effector systems, but they're also affected by movement. The definition that was developed at Washington University is the human movement system is a system of physiological organ systems that interact to produce movement of the body and its parts. So it is a system of systems and it takes a special expertise to be able to be knowledgeable enough about this system. And what could be better? Because movement is an essential function of life at all levels of a living organism. So whether it's ions moving through membranes, or you're moving your limbs, or you're moving in your environment, it's all about movement. 
I think what's important to also realize is that highly respected health professions really achieve their status by having expertise in a specific anatomical or physiological body, body system. The neurologist, it's clear that they take care of the nervous systems. The orthopedists take care of the skeletal system. Cardiologists take care of the cardiac system. And even the dentists have a defined oral cavity. And the podiatrists, they take care of the foot. So the, the world expects them to know all about these specific areas, these specific systems, and to be able to understand the dysfunctions of those systems and to make diagnosis and to know how to recommend the best treatment program. That's exactly the parallel that we should have with the human movement system. And um, the, the, the system diagnosis, I think these are ones that every physical therapist should make. Now that doesn't mean they're all going to be making the same syndromes that I'm going to be talking to you about here because we know we have the McKinsey practitioners and they have diagnosis. I believe they're categorized as the uh, MDT approach to patient care. We have the TBC or the treatment-based diagnosis. And then there are people in the profession that want to talk about specific tissue impairments or make pathoanatomic diagnosis. In the neurological patients, um, there's also the movement system impairment syndromes, but these are more neuromuscular, while for our musculoskeletal system, we consider them neuromusculoskeletal. And also there are cardiopulmonary diagnosis. So th this is a the rubric of movement system diagnosis should apply across the board to all practicing physical therapists. And so the, the big issue, and I think this is what is not well known to the public, is it matters what your alignment is. It matters how you move. For example, in this young woman going up a step, I think it's you can see that she doesn't have her knee aligned well. And often, after a period of time, this will begin to hurt. And if we have her instead correct her alignment so that her knee is now going over her foot, which is by an adjustment in her hip, then the, the, there'll be more optimal stresses placed on her knee joint. Similarly, knowing that there is an ideal way to move, and it's not just a matter of, well, if it doesn't hurt, it's acceptable. For example, this young man, when he flexes his shoulders, looks fine while he's going up, but when you watch him come back down, you can see that his scapula look very prominent. This would be a fault of what we consider excessive anterior tilt and internal rotation. So once more, you'll see the border of the scapula becoming particularly prominent. Now, he can do it differently. So with a few minutes of instruction, he can easily flex his shoulder, let it come down without the winging of the scapula. So our belief is that people should be analyzed for these movement faults and know that it isn't acceptable just to move in any way you want to. And then, so the critical question is, having precise joint movement, is that really important? I, I contend that it is, just as there are signs before there are symptoms for other conditions. If you high, have high cholesterol, you don't wait for your heart attack. If your blood sugar level is high and you're developing the metabolic syndrome, you don't wait until you really get diabetes. If your blood pressure is high, you don't wait to have a stroke. You attend to these signs before they do become symptoms. So why, if people do start off with precise movement, which again, they may not in the first place, why does it become impaired? Well, daily activities, as well as sports and fitness activities, which only further the development of imprecise movement. And why? because tissues make adaptations during those activities, and they aren't always optimal. So how should impaired joint motion be corrected? Do we use stretching programs, strengthening programs, retraining programs, or some combination of those? Again, this key question, why does precise moment be movement become impaired? It can be attributed to the repeated movements and prolonged postures of everyday activities. Just as the body is supposed to do when you use it, 
it changes. So you get adaptive changes. There's nothing dysfunctional or abnormal about these specific changes. It's just the combination, as we will try to explain. And these adaptive changes vary because of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Now we have a little model that we use to give you the overall picture here. And we call it a kinesiopathologic model of the movement system because the emphasis is on how movement induces pathology. There's also a pathokinesiologic model, and that's how pathology of other systems induces movement faults. But for our purposes, we're going to concentrate on how movement induces pathological problems. So as, as shown previously by the human movement system, we've got the musculoskeletal nervous systems, the cardiopulmonary and endocrine systems. And the interface with all of these symptoms is biomechanics. The inducers are repeated movements and prolonged postures. Now exactly what happens with these inducers varies because of personal characteristics, intrinsic factors like how tall you are, how what your body proportions are. Do you have a long trunk or a short trunk? Do you have long legs? Do you tend to be hypermobile? Do you have wide hips? All of those will influence exactly what the adaptations are. Your activity demands. Do, do you constantly exercise? Do you exercise intensely? Do you have minimal exercise activities? Is your job very demanding? Or is the biggest thing you do is sit on a computer all day and all night? Well, depending upon those factors, you're going to get specific tissue adaptations. And we think that the real key to how those adaptations behave is that the body follows the path of least resistance for movement. Just like everything else in this world, the body follows the laws of physics, and it takes the path of least resistance. Now, two of those things that affect what this path is, and I'm sure there are others, the nervous system has something to do with this, of course, but two of these things that we want to talk about specifically are what's called relative stiffness of muscle and connective tissue, and the other one is relative flexibility which pertains to joint behavior. And there's intrajoint relative flexibility and interjoint relative flexibility. Now, the result of repeatedly taking this path of least resistance is that a joint accessory motions become hypermobile. You can also think of this as sort of micro instability. From this repeated instability, in a joint, you get microtrauma of the tissues about that joint, and that eventually becomes macrotrauma over time. So the working theory here is that musculoskeletal pain is related to lifestyle, similar to many other health conditions. That it's a progressive condition, starting with acute pain, which is usually your first indication of tissue damage. But as we all know, there's a high reoccurrence rate with musculoskeletal pain conditions. So that leads to a chronic problem. Now this is really the result of tissue changes associated with aging related to generation, which does take place, much as we wish it didn't, and activity-induced tissue injury from impaired joint movement. So is we're contending that musculoskeletal pain is produced by the way activities of daily living are performed, as well as by personal characteristics. We'll use these two pictures as an example. The young woman in red is actually an occupational therapist who treats pediatric patients and she develops back pain. So why is she sitting like this? Well, as you might guess, she sits like that when she's treating the pediatric patients that she sees all day almost every day, or at least five days a week. Now what's also interesting is that when questioned carefully about what she does in the evening, which she responded by saying, I uh, like to watch television and I read, and when asking her how she sat, she said, well, I sit on a sofa like everyone else. But with further uh, pursuit of this, it turns out that she sits just like this because it's what's familiar, it's what seems comfortable until her back started to hurt. 
you can look clearly at the alignment of her back, and if you sit like this for prolonged periods of time, you're going to develop back pain. The other individual on the left side, left hand side of the picture is actually a research scientist who works on some objects on a on a counter, on a bench in front of her. But after she finishes doing what she's supposed to do to those little objects, she puts them into a hood. Now the little arrow and the alignment of her trunk can be considered a clue because that hood that she puts them in is on the left side. So she repeatedly turns to the left side and what happens is her back is stayed turned to the left side. Now here's where personal characteristics play a role. You can tell from this picture that she does not have well-developed abdominals. This is in contrast to the pictures on your right where that young woman does have well-developed abdominal muscles. Well, it's abdominal muscles that play a key role in limiting how far you can rotate and then after you rotate, returning you back to that starting neutral position. So this woman got into more trouble because of her personal characteristics. Well, probably the other individual got into less trouble because of her personal characteristics, though I'm going to make a point that these days with so much emphasis on core strengthening that we're seeing problems arising because people have overdeveloped their abdominals, not just have underdeveloped abdominal muscles. So these are two good examples of how daily activities, repeated performance, have created pain problems. So the big challenge is to keeping the acute problem from becoming chronic. We all know that acute symptoms subside just with time. If you wait it out, take some time off, rest, your symptoms get better. Interventions. You can get medication that helps. Uh, there's papers even that indicate that if you go to an amusement park, your back pain gets better. We know there are a variety variety of interventions that help take care of acute symptoms. But reoccurrence is so common. 80 to 90 percent of people have a reoccurrence of back pain or neck pain or shoulder pain. And we believe that one of the major reasons is that treatment is primarily symptomatic. People look for what tissues hurt and treat the tissues. That is not really the cause the cause is the impaired movement and the way people are doing their activities. The adaptations that have taken place are not commonly addressed to be then corrected. So our belief is that we can really minimize recurrence if we identify the movement cause as well as the contributing factors which are those tissue adaptations. We can also develop a treatment program that includes patient specific exercises and really, really important, the correction of performance of basic daily activities. That goes right along with correcting the performance of work, recreation, fitness, and sports activities. So, the repetition of impaired movement may accelerate the development of osteoarthritis. This is another one of our theories, and it's based on information about how osteoarthritis has many mechanical mechanisms. And these are a variety of references that speak to the fact that cartilage de degradation can be correlated with abnormal excessive articular contact. And you can get this from excessive loading, from weakened articulations, ligamentum laxi, muscle weakness, or reduced proprioception. Anything that leads to articular instability or this micro instability that was referred to previously. Other articles that have addressed the uh, development of osteoarthritis related to malalignment are in the knee if your meniscal tissue is injured, car you have cartilage lesions, joint instability. In some way we think these all have followed a joint instability. And needless to say, there can be trauma, but you do wonder how many people are accidents waiting to happen.
If a researcher wants to study osteoarthritis, what they do is get a, a little mouse and they are a little rat and they put a lesion in the medial meniscus and then they have the little rat run. And lo and behold, before too long, the rat or the mouse develops osteoarthritis. Well, we want to address these little precipitating factors as we see it the cause. Just like there are alterations in spinal alignment create points of high contact pressure. People with a scoliosis are actually born with a normal spine. But over time, from whatever reasons, not all of them identified, the spine becomes rotated and, and bent in certain ways so that you get points of high contact stress and the development of pain problems. So, our guiding theory for these movement system impairment syndromes, or MSI as we call them, is that little things mean a lot. That there's this underlying problem of micro instability. Now this term of wobble wobble, which I so like, was actually used and developed by some uh, English biomechanists. And the idea here is that accessory motions, the roll, spin, or glide, becomes excessive in one or more directions. That's the intra-joint microstability, or relative flexibility. And that, you get this microtrauma from shear forces and points of high contact stress that over time becomes macrauma. Now, the characteristics of this joint micro-instability is that the range is more than optimal. So the joint surfaces are not moving optimally, creating these points of high contact stress as well as shear force. They also move more often than optimal and we believe more readily in a specific direction. It is exemplified from this picture from Donald Newman's textbook. If the uh, head of the femur, the head of the humerus is not moving optimally during abduction with the appropriate roll and sliding and you just get roll, you're going to have a little bit of shear forces and you're also going to have this pinching of the subacromial bursa as well as the supraspinatus tendon. So this is a small, it can be small amount of motion and that just over time it creates this trauma. Now this accessory micro instability which progresses over time is present whether you have normal physiological motion, certainly excessive physiological motion, and even when you have limited physiological motion. Even when you have a frozen shoulder, or adhesive capsulitis, uh, and even speaking from personal experience on this problem, even though my range of motion was markedly limited, I still had excessive superior and anterior glide from my humeral head. So how do we assess this? Well, we actually use physiological motions, both passive and active. This will be part of our courses, is to help teach you how to uh, assess this imprecise motion. And of course it, it all depends upon how you feel this motion taking place as well as observe it. We call it kind of going along for the ride. And after we observe as is demonstrated here in this series of pictures at the bottom, uh, if the hip is moving normally, as the hip is flexed, this thumb which is situated as a parallel axle for the point of rotation of the femur stays in one place. If there's imprecise hip flexion, the femur will do what we call anterior glide and medially rotate. And as shown by the uh, skeletal demonstration here, if this is the incorrect motion, the head of the femur can hit on the edge of the acetabulum and injure tissues. If you have the perfect spinning, then you do not have trauma to the edge of the acetabulum. So we attempt to manually correct when the motion is imprecise. And you will have a lot of examples of this. The key concepts, as we've already mentioned, is that we think that the major one is that the body takes the path of least resistance for motion. And relative flexibility is the intrajoint relative flexibility means that one of the intrinsic accessory motions becomes sort of hypermobile and moves too readily 
in that direction, like the example of excessive rolling or excessive gliding. In interjoint relative flexibility, it means motions is taking place at one segment of the body rather than at the other. A common demonstration of this is when someone forward bends and their back flexes much more easily than their hip. So they have excessive lumbar flexion and limited hip flexion. That would be interjoint relative flexibility. Now, what are the factors that play a role? The passive tension of muscle in connective tissues. So on interjoint motion, if your back extensors are less stiff than your hip extensors, that will contribute to the excessive lumbar flexion. The result of all of this is the phenomena that I've been talking about, about micro instability. We believe it's what moves is what hurts. And we also have some evidence for that. The way you do your everyday activities is the critical issue. The repeated movements and prolonged postures. In a recently completed study that's in the process of being published, Linda Van Dillen has demonstrated that if you have people hold their spine neutral during functional activities, their pain scores will go down for six months. These individuals had only received six weeks of treatment, once a week of teaching people how to move correctly, to move where they should move, and to avoid movements of the spine that are inappropriate. This clearly played the major role in reducing their symptoms. And beside this, an important additional factor that Linda identified is that people will adhere to change in their functional activities for longer periods of time than they will do their exercise programs. Continuing with the key concepts, another important one, I think it's a critically important one, is that you get what you train. You have many strategies to create moments at a joint or within a limb. For example, this picture of a ballerina has arrows pointing to her feet. And that's because I've seen many times, and I'm sure you have too, if you ask a young woman or even an older woman to do a straight leg raise, they often will point their toes if they've taken ballet. They said, how did you know I took ballet? Because you're still pointing your toes. I know that individuals that have started ballet very early actually have a hard time having good abdominal muscles. And one of the reasons is they have co-contracted all of their limb muscles, the quads and hamstrings, and they hold the pelvis still rather than the abdominal muscles being the primary movement of holding the pelvis still. Another training mode for the ballet dancer is that they're taught to hold their shoulders down while they raise their arms up over their head to give a long line to their neck. Many people continue to do this long after they've stopped ballet. There are multiple examples I could give you, and I think I wish I had another 50 years in the profession to work out more details but we'll try to make more of them clear as we go through this particular presentation. But do be on the alert because people behave according to how they're trained. That's the other critical factor in establishing the path of least resistance. Another key concept is just because you're wearing a muscle doesn't mean you're using it. This young woman has diminished gluteal definition because of the sway back posture. Her line of gravity is way behind her hip joint and that's decreasing her muscle use. <coughs> At the other extreme, as I've seen marathon runners, young women with a sway back posture, who've developed a stress fracture of their lesser trochanter. And the reason is that in the sway back postures, the iliopsoas muscle can become your uh, stance muscle 
preventing your hip from hyperextending. And when you're running, it helps to control the pelvis during stance phase. And then during swing phase, it's also active for the forward swing of the hip. So it's active during stance phase, up, up, active during swing phase. And that means that if you do 26 miles, you're going to get excessive stress on the lesser trochanter, the insertion of the iliopsoas, and get a stress fracture. So your alignment, your activities are all going to play a major role in how your muscles function. And they don't always function optimally, no matter what your exercise program. And this is another fact that there's no magic in an exercise except if the desired motion is evident. I have this example of a young man doing a push-up for a very specific reason. It does strengthen the serratus anterior, but that does not mean that it will improve your scapula. The chances are very high that actually when he does do shoulder flexion, he will not have optimal scapular upward rotation. I've seen several people who have done plank exercises with great intensity, and one of the consequences has been inadequate scapular motion because the exercise has them fix their scapula. When you really think about the whole concept of the movement system and you realize how important activity exercise is to your health, and that there is a real challenge to optimal development of this system, it really highlights the idea that the physical therapist needs to be a lifespan practitioner. I, I think it's so interesting that we go to a dentist as soon as we get our teeth and we go on at least once to twice a year to make sure that our teeth stay healthy. And they only do two things for us. They help us to speak and to eat. And here we are with our whole body that's critical to everything we do. And we don't have an expert that's monitoring the development, optimizing the use of that body so that we reduce the incidence of early musculoskeletal pain. We're not going to eliminate it forever, but we can cut down on unnecessary. We can help structure exercise programs that are appropriate for people. We can identify structural variations that need to be addressed. It's such an important thing for us to be doing is become lifespan practitioners. I pulled these pictures just out of uh, the off the internet and out of the newspaper and it's so clear when you look at these activities that people are performing and this is a junior varsity group at a uh, very good school. And you can see how poor the performance is of almost every one of these individuals. We need to be out there helping to shape exercise programs, alignment, move patterns. So movement system impairment syndromes, they are named for the movement direction that causes symptoms and that is impaired. The correction of the movement usually decreases the symptoms. We believe they identify the cause of the dysfunction and the contributing factors, these tissue and neuromuscular impairments. They organize and cluster specific tissue and then impairments. So the MSI syndromes provide a direction for treatment. They do not require identification of a specific pathoanatomical structure or source. It's based on anatomy and kinesiology and are considering the multiple segments and their interaction, not just one isolated segment of the body, one joint. It's their interactions that we also think are so important. These are interacting segments and we have to look at those interactions as a major contributing factor. And just to highlight this cause versus source, source is the tissue or the pathoanatomical structure that's symptomatic. For years, dancers were diagnosed when they had anterior groin pain with iliopsoas tendonitis. Now we know that most itises are really not itises, they're really osis, but we're not really sure, so we call it an opathy. I think patellofemoral dysfunction is another good example. 
the treatment for so long has just been concentrated at the knee joint itself. And yet the work of Chris Powers and some others is showing that the cause is really up here in the hip. It's the femur rotating medially under the patella that's causing the problem. So as we're looking at these problems, we're looking for the cause, the mechanical or movement factor that results in the tissue irritation. We would be calling this knee pain problem a tibial femoral rotation syndrome because we think that's what's happening. That many of these groin pain problems can be attributed to what we call femoral anterior glide and usually with medial rotation. So there's a big difference between what tissue hurts and what's causing it to hurt. Here's another good example. This uh, young man was referred to me. In fact, the neurosurgeon himself called me and said, I have a, a patient I'd like you to see. He's had pain in his interscapular region for over two years, and we have not been able to find anything wrong with him. We've done all of the radiological and electrophysiological tests that we could possibly do, and yet we believe this is a legitimate complaint. We've tried various kinds of treatment, including taping his scapula. So if we just, again, watch him move, and let's see what happens when he flexes his shoulder. Now, as mentioned, he's a right-handed construction worker. It's his left shoulder, and you can see, again, the vertebral border, the scapula becoming particularly prominent as he flexes and his shoulder and also when it returns to the baseline. Now it's easy to think, well, this is just weakness of that serratus anterior muscle, but if we play this just one more time and watch him flex his shoulder, and his head shouldn't move when he flexes his right shoulder either, but here's his scapula winging. And if I stop it right here, and we look at this, when you have true weakness of your serratus anterior, you can't possibly abduct your scapula so far. In fact, it would really adduct, and you would also never get this degree of upward rotation from your scapula. So we have to look for a different explanation for this problem, but it's clearly a diagnosis of scapular internal rotation with anterior tilt and even abduction. And we believe this falls into the category of primarily a recruitment impairment problem, a activation problem to be more specific. Here's another example of a movement impairment. And this young man has back pain. And if we have him bend forward and you try to decide is this good forward bending, is this a good return from forward bending, how does this play a role in his pain problem? I think if you look carefully at the major deficit, and we can stop it right here, is that his hips are not moving and that all the motion is taking place in his back. You cannot say that this is excessive lumbar flexion because he's not even getting the 20 degrees of lumbar motion that is considered the industry standard. But I think the main fault is that when he returns from this bending, and most of that motion is occurring right here at the level of his iliac crest, is that when he comes back up, it's repeated lumbar extension. Now, what's the way that we're going to correct this problem? We're going to have to teach him to do hip extension and to avoid the lumbar extension. There's no exercise in the world that's going to have him automatically correct that movement pattern. The only way it's going to be corrected is for him to learn how to do hip extension on the return rather than lumbar extension. Just picking pictures out of the newspapers, being in St. Louis, you can't help but be a Cardinal fan. And we look at two hitters, and I think it wouldn't be hard to say that this man is going to end up with back pain very soon. And interestingly, this is the type of movement pattern you get when your abdominals are too stiff and they don't allow you to rotate. Well, this pattern is one that allows you to get great hits and not be in danger of injuring your pain. So what are these MSI syndromes? Well, as mentioned previously, they're determined by the motion direction or alignment that most consistently elicits symptoms, is impaired, and when it's corrected, 
the symptoms decrease or sometimes they're totally eliminated. So they're really named for movements, for the low back, flexion, extension, rotation, and then the combination motions of flexion, rotation, extension, rotation. And then for the hip, we have femoral, accessory motion impairment, so these people have joint-related symptoms. And then for the hip, we have physiological movement impairments. And all of these will be covered in subsequent courses. So the question is, <clears throat> why define syndromes or make a diagnosis? Well, the real difference between an expert and a novice is pattern recognition. And in physical therapy, we haven't done well in describing patterns, yet the whole basis of medical practice is to describe the pattern that goes with a specific diagnosis and then order tests to confirm or disconfirm that diagnosis. And what I believe should happen in physical therapy is that we should be describing these patterns, of course, looking at the evidence behind those patterns and analyzing them critically. And, and we should teach those and so that the people coming along can make it better and not try to just get back to where that experienced therapist had been. And the other reason for making diagnosis is that it will facilitate treatment. We have a lot of our time required when we see a patient. We have to do, take a history, <clears throat> do an exam, <clears throat> consider the material, arrive at a treatment program, and deliver the treatment program. And all of that within a constrained period of time. How much more efficient we would be if we could look at a pattern, quickly assess whether we are accurate or not, and then get on with a treatment that's also been somewhat described, not that it won't be changed in the future. Th this would also tell people that there are such syndromes and what their relationship is to pain problems. Uh, this would facilitate the recognition of the profession. No one's going to think we figure anything out until we put a label on it. It would enhance our communication within the profession as well as outside the profession. And by grouping conditions, we will do better in developing prognosis, understanding the etiology, as well as improving the treatment and the research. So this is really a, an area in which I have a strong commitment to promote as strongly as I can to developing diagnosis, to describe syndromes, and to direct treatment. So what is the examination for the MSI syndromes? Well, it's really basically a movement examination with the contributing factors, such as the information that comes from looking at alignment, looking at muscle performance, which includes aspects of length, strength, and stiffness, the neuromuscular activation patterns, and then the movement of specific limbs, specific joints, and the total body during functional activities. And all of this with biomechanical factors like relationships to line of gravity in mind as you go through your examination, part of which we will be discussing later on. So here's an example of a, a woman with back pain. And this is a first step in observing movement. And we ask her to walk, and when she walks, you can see, well, they might have a little tendency here to have excessive lumbo-pelvic rotation. And indeed, when you watch her walk, particularly from the back, you can see that she does have excessive lumbo-pelvic rotation. But then we also have to say, well, I wonder why she walks like that. And I think what's very obvious is that she has very large hips. Now, that isn't just because she's overweight. Even if she was very thin, she would have very large hips. And they play into this situation. For example, when I think this is the kind of hips that when you put your hands on the sides of her pelvis, your fingers can rest right on top of the greater trochanter. 
She also has Janu valgus. So she probably has coxovera hips. What does that mean? It means when she's sleeping on her side at night that because her pelvis is so broad, she's going to have her uh, spine in a side bend for hour after hour. It also would be typical for her to drape her leg across her body so that her hip flexors, medial rotators also tend to, to tighten up. So these are all ways in which her structure is playing into the way she walks, and the way she walks with excessive lumbopelvic rotation can contribute to her pain. So there's a vicious cause and effect working here. Her walking pattern contributes to excessive rotational flexibility of her low back. The rotation is the result of excessive mobility of her lumbar spine. So this is the relative flexibility. It's easier for her lumbar spine to rotate than for her hip joint to extend. And one of the contributing factors, as we've talked about before, is the stiffness of her hip musculature. So her hip medial rotator flexors are stiffer than her abdominals, which keeps her pelvis, pelvis motion moving. So the more she walks, the stiffer her hip muscles get because she's using them, and the more flexible her lumbar spine becomes. Okay, this is a, another example. So this young man is sitting in his comfortable resting posture, which is really pretty amazing uh, that he can sit like that. And you have to attribute it to the tension in his abdominal muscles as well as his hip flexors. What you can also see is that his back extensors are in an elongated position because this is a degree of lumbar flexion. As mentioned, his abdominals have to be somewhat short and stiff. He's in a slight posterior pelvic tilt and hip extension. Uh, his head and shoulders are creating a, a bit of a flexion moment, not as much as if he was uh, sitting upright a little more. And this feels right to him. So even in the quadruped position, the tension of his abdominals is greater than the tension in his back extensors uh, when they're in the flex position. So anteriorly the abdominals are contributing to flexion and posteriorly the back extensors are allowing the back to be flexed. And then when he rocks back, his back extensors are more extensible than his hip extensors, so it increases the lumbar flexion. And so this would be a demonstration of relative stiffness because his back is flexing instead of his hips. You could also consider it relative flexibility because it's easier for his lumbar spine to flex than his, for his hips to flex. And the question is how did he get that way? And it was by doing these bent knee sit-ups. That when you're doing bent knee sit-ups and you get to the hip flexion phase of the motion because the hips and knees are flexed there you have to do something actively to hold your feet down on the floor as the hip flexors contract so you actually end up co-contracting hip flexors and hip extensors that means your hips are not going to flex but rather your lumbar spine is going to flex and the more you stay in this posterior tilt hip flex hip position the shorter the abdominal muscles get. So his 200 sit-ups a day are contributing to the elongation of his back extensors, shifting the axis of motion to his lumbar spine rather than to his hip joint and to shortening his abdominal muscles. So here comes the vicious cycle. Lumbar flexion during sitting, cycling, working shoulders forward of his hips in sitting so he gets a flexion moment on his lumbar spine. His pelvis tilts posteriorly, the hamstrings become short and stiff, and then if he was sitting and doing knee extension it would even tilt the pelvis posteriorly and flex the lumbar spine. When he's in the sitting position he has minimal energy expenditure. When there's lengthened back extensor muscles 
and his abdominals become shorter, flex the thoracic and lumbar spine. If he would sit up erectly, it would be uncomfortable and it would feel wrong. So that's exactly what happens in this particular series of pictures taken out of Florence Kendall's book. This young man is standing in a very sway back posture. So his back is actually flat. He, when he leans forward, you can see he's able to put his chest on his thighs, which can be considered desirable in some exercise forms, but what I consider a disaster, because this is clearly excessive lumbar flexion. Now he has a lot of hip flexion, but this is really excessive lumbar flexion. And he's going to sit with his back in flexion. That's where it must go before he gets some passive tension from his back extensors. He does have his head and shoulders forward of his lumbar spine, so he's creating a very strong flexion moment on his lumbar spine. And when he extends his knee, he's in posterior pelvic tilt and, hip ex and partial hip extension. If he sits up with his hip at least 80 degrees of hip flexion, you can see how limited the hamstring excursion is. We also know that it, he won't sit like this for a prolonged period of time because now he has to hold himself with both his back extensors and his hip flexors in shortened positions. And for sure, his back muscles are going to cramp or get tired. So once you establish all these muscle adaptations from your activity, then they're reflected in all of your activities. And we always seek the, the position of minimal energy expenditure. So you go to where the passive tension is the most useful for minimizing that energy. So the tissues that change with repeated movement, prolonged postures are muscular, neurological, skeletal. And we have to consider all of those when we develop a plan for prevention, intervention, or long-term maintenance. So we think that having a working diagnosis improves the efficiency. It allows us to cluster information from our visual appraisal and from the history. And if you know what the syndromes are, those are going to be clues. For example, if you had this obese woman coming in to see you, and she's 60 years old and she has low back pain, and uh, she's only five foot tall and works as a cook, and she begins to tell you that, uh, well, maybe I'm getting so much back pain because uh, I, I'm having to go to the bathroom so frequently. But no wonder, I'm just thirsty as could be. But you wouldn't believe it. I've got this great appetite, but I'm still losing weight. Well, I don't think it would take you very long to start saying, oh my goodness, have you told your physician about this? I think he needs to check you over. Because you'd be thinking she has probably diabetes. She says, no, I didn't tell my doctor because, you know, I, I wanted to lose weight anyway. And that's great. It's just my back that's killing me. And so that's what we focused on. Well, now, if you hadn't known of diabetes, you would never be able to fit this together. And suppose you didn't know of diabetes and you are just taken a course on incontinence and you just focused on the incontinence part of this and you say, oh, aren't you lucky? I've just learned how to deal with urinary incontinence, <clears throat> and I think I can help you with it. That would be a misleading working diagnosis because you didn't have the full pattern. And that's just what we're trying to say. If she's five foot tall and works as a cook, she's obese, it's probably pretty clear that she doesn't have good abdominals. We know that she's standing all the time. We know that she's probably rotating. And we know that she's 60 years old so my working diagnosis for her movement system problem would be rotation extension. Because at five feet tall, even when she sits down, her feet don't touch the ground, and she's probably going to be pulled into extension. So the chief complaint, her age, which is going to suggest that she's probably got degenerative spinal changes that relate to extension. Her prominent abdomen, she probably has a kyphosis that would also contribute to extension. Five feet. As I say, even when she's sitting down, they don't touch the ground. They're going to pull her into extension. Her weight, over 190 pounds, means she has poor abdominal muscles. 
That also contributes to extension. Her body proportions, if she has wide hips, would be extension, rotation, and her standing to do her job is going to also mean extension, rotation. So there are a lot of factors here that suggest the pattern of extension and rotation. So here's another example. So here's a woman that in standing she has more pain than when she's sitting. She's 45, so that's not very useful. That's sort of not too young and not too old, so she's kind of on the cusp. Height is five foot three. Well, five foot three, um, I'm five foot four, and when I'm sitting, my feet just touch the ground. So she's a little bit on the short side, and probably her feet don't touch the ground when she's sitting. Though I've had patients as tall as five foot seven who had legs shorter than mine. That's why body proportions are important. Her weight is 140 pounds. That means she's a little bit overweight, <clears throat> but not, not too bad. Uh, probably in America we'd consider this uh, skinny. She has a, a, a lardosis, uh, which means an increased uh, lumbar curve with an anterior pelvic tilt, which is displayed by this flexi ruler uh, showing the outline of her back. And she's also a piano teacher. Now let's put that together, and let's see, what when she bends forward, her pain decreases. Well, that would suggest she has a lumbar extension problem also. She had more pain when she was standing. Here she just reverses her lumbar curve. When she returned from the forward bending, she had hip extension, I'm sorry, correction, she did lumbar extension rather than hip extension, and her pain increased. That would also support a working diagnosis of lumbar extension. And then when she's sitting, and most people when they teach the piano try to sit up straight, so they usually hold themselves in a little bit of exaggerated extension. And they have to use their back extensors and their hip flexors because they don't have a back support, they sit on a piano bench. So when we put it all together, her alignment, her little, her symptoms, that are greater in standing, greater with the return from forward bending of lumbar extension, uh, decreased by forward bending, that this all fits a pattern of lumbar extension. So her height, her weight, her age, uh, only her height suggests lumbar extension. Her weight, not really, nor does her, her age particularly. But her alignment does, her pattern of bending and returning to standing, her occupation and recreational activities all influence these mechanical factors leading to pain with extension. And then we have to say, well, what are the contributing factors? What are the adaptive tissue changes that contribute to the condition? Are her hip flexor muscles short or stiff? Are her abdominals weak, long, or maybe not stiff enough? What about her lumbar extensors? Are they hypertrophied? Are they short and stiff, all contributing to extension? Well, here's another example. So this is a, a young man with low back pain. He's 23 years old. His weight is 175 pounds, so he's rather lean for being six foot tall. He's a student, so immediately what comes to mind is sitting. He's a competitive cyclist, but also you can picture easily is that he probably is riding his bicycle down on the drops, as they say, so that his lumbar spine would be in flexion. When we look at him standing, his lumbar spine is actually flat. We don't see a lumbar curve. So from just this information, I would say that our working diagnosis is a lumbar flexion syndrome. And then we have him bend forward. And when he bends forward, he gets pain in his back, and what you can also see is that he has excessive lumbar flexion. His uh, belt line is right here, that's where the top of his iliac crest is as compared to his hips, where, where his waistband is. You can also see that his hips are not flexing well. Even in the quadruped position, his lumbar spine is flexed and his hips aren't flexed well enough. And again we note very well developed abdominal muscle activities. Very well abdominal muscles uh, that are probably not active in this position. 
So, if we just look and compare the findings of these two different types of patients, one with a flexion syndrome and one with an extension syndrome, most likely the flexion syndrome patients are young and tall, while extension patients are usually older, short, and if the pain is chronic, it's usually also extension. The abdominal muscles are very often strong or stiff in people with a flexion problem. And in fact, uh, with people so emphasizing strengthening the core, we're finding excessive abdominal muscle development, which adds to the compression because these muscles not only flex you, but they add to the compression of the joints. They have a vertical passive tension. While in the extension patients, it's more likely to find the abdominal muscles weak or long, uh, not stiff enough. The back extensors in the flexion patients are weak or long, and in extension patients, they can be just the opposite, strong or stiff. The hip flexors in the flexion patients are most likely long, except the exception often is the tensor fasciolata iliotibial band. Well, they can be short or stiff in the extension patients. The patient with uh, flexion can have short or stiff hip extensors like the hamstrings, contributing to more lumbar motion than hip motion, while the extension patients, the hamstrings can actually be long. The activities of a flexion patient are to sit flex, particularly if you're tall and your knees are higher than your hips, or in the extension patient to sit extended, and just the opposite situation if you're short and your knees tend to be lower than your hips because your feet don't touch the ground. So by just clustering these two syndromes, you can see that they're going to have very different treatment programs, very different recommendations. So as movement experts, what do we want to do? We want to be able to collaborate with physicians to help identify the source of pain, what we call sorting the diagnostic dilemmas. I had a very vivid an example because my own uncle at age 84 developed pain in his knee. And because he had pain in his knee, his doctor referred him to an orthopedist. Well, because he was 84 and had been an electrician on his feet all his life, his knee pain, his, his knees showed degenerative wear. So one and one being two, my uncle had a knee joint replacement. Now, unfortunately, that didn't resolve his pain. And finally, after six months of still the same kind of pain in his knee, he called me to see if I could help him. So I took a look at him, and it was as simple as lean forward. And when he leaned forward, the pain in his knee went away. Stand up straight and lean back. And when he leaned back, the knee pain came back on. So he had a knee joint replacement for what was a lumbar extension syndrome, undoubtedly associated with degenerative disease in his back. In fact, when he was in his 40s, he had had a, uh, a herniated disc episode. So I've had many patients since that time that also have had pain in their knee that came from their back. and. Unfortunately, several of them had had knee joint replacements, which is what had happened to my uncle, rather than addressing the pain that was coming from their back. And uh, we actually had a lecture by one of the uh, orthopedic medicine people, and he talked about seductive techno radiology. And that's when you are dealing with people that are older, every part of their musculoskeletal system is going to look old and degenerated. And I think that that place of real responsibility on us to help sort out where are these pains really coming from, which can only be done by a physical exam. Uh, so that's, that's the message. I think we also should collaborate with other exercise providers to direct the specificity of programs. Um, personal trainers, yoga teachers, etc. I don't want to be uh, taking people through exercise programs on a regular basis. 
I want to just figure out what they need and what they need to avoid and whether they're doing the right program. So I think we should cooperate with all of these other exercise people to be sure that all individuals are getting the right kind of exercise. So, one of the things we can do and need to do is to assess the precision of joint motion. Now, I know that there's a lot of emphasis that's been placed on the profession, and which is to assess the passive joint motion, and, and that's all well and good. But we also need to assess what happens during active motion. So our criteria for precise joint motion is that it's consistent with the kinesiological standard, that the accessory motion is consistent, and that the physiological motion is consistent and that there's optimal muscle activation. For example, using this picture from Donald Newman's kinesiology book on what happens during hip flexion and extension. As is illustrated by this drawing, there's a single point of rotation and the femur should just spin in the acetabulum. Just like you could drive an axle right through that femur and the hip would spin perfectly. And that takes place during both flexion and extension. And here's another illustration of the same point. So here's the single point of the axis of rotation for flexion and extension. This is another depiction of that single point of rotation. You can see that for uh, ab and abduction, there's a little bit of gliding as there is for also for rotation. So back to a picture that you saw earlier, that with this mock-up, it's intended to make the point that if you spin perfectly, then the head of the femur really stays clear of the edge of the acetabulum. If your hip flexion is imprecise, then you have what we call anterior glide with medial rotation. As this motion is performed, you can hit on the edge of the acetabulum, which of course is where the labrum is, as well as other structures that can get traumatized by repeatedly hitting on the edge of the acetabulum. So just to make that really clear, here's a an attempt to demonstrate the motion itself. So now it's perfectly spinning, just like it should. Well, it started to go astray. So we'll try it again, and what you'll see is perfect, sp imperfect spinning. And the femur, here's another view, so that if you flex your hip, and let's try it just once more so we can get it right. Then if you flex your hip like this, you can see how the head of the femur is hitting on the edge of the acetabulum. At the knee joint, it's, it's not so easy, but again, you can have undesirable movement. The, um, you can't drive an axle right through the knee joint because the motion is defined as an ellipsoid because there's some rolling and gliding as the femur moves on the tibia. And there's also some spinning. So it's not rotation about a single point. Go. But nonetheless, if we look at this young woman and we have her stand on her right leg, then what you see Go. is that she gets medial rotation and some hyperextension as she does that. Go. Now, if you look carefully, you can go all the way down to her ankle and you'll see also that her right ankle is a Go. little more prominent at the medial malleolus than her left. And that this motion at, down at her ankle is taking Go. place as talocrural motion rather than subtalar motion. So even without looking at the front of her foot, I'm highly suspicious she has Go. a stiff foot.
And that is a good example of our taking the path of least resistance because it means that when she go. stands on this leg, if her foot is really stiff, then <clears throat> as her hip immediately rotates, which is the offensive motion, it's going to be manifested at her knee joint, and that's going to give her knee pain, which was her problem. Oh. We could quickly address that by teaching her to correct this this motion. So what she's doing now oh. is she was instructed to tighten her buttocks muscles and not let her knee turn in, which she's able to do quite successfully. Oh. So then you can see it stops the motion at the ankle as well as at her knee joint. So this is a good demonstration of it's an activation oh. pattern problem because her hip musculature is not controlling the medial rotation that's taking place. So it would be good if everybody could start with ideal alignment. And why? Because it prevents postural deformities and pain syndromes. It should minimize your tendency. You would uh, keep joint integrity and reduce stress. Uh, it would contribute to optimal movement patterns as well as having optimal muscle length. So, <laughs> in fact, if we look at this picture, here's this bicycle that I saw all carefully locked up, and I wondered why would you even need to lock up a bicycle that is so bent out of shape. Now, clearly, it's not going to move correctly. So I think we can take a lesson from this bicycle, that if you're really bent out of shape, your chances of moving well are very poor. In fact, if we look at this collage of pictures, I think it's clear to everyone that this woman has DJD of the, of the knee joint. And uh, there's work by Sharma that says if you start off with more bowing of your knee, it just increases over time. It wouldn't be surprising to think that <clears throat> this fellow has low back pain. You can see his increased lumbar curve. And of course, she has neck pain. And I know it may be a little more subtle, but she has pain in this scapular area. And you can see the uh, sort of undesirable positioning of her left shoulder right there. Now we want to begin to talk more <clears throat> about what are the specific underlying tissue adaptations. What are the mechanisms that contribute to the development of these syndromes? The key factor <clears throat> is the repeated movements of everyday activities and the prolonged postures of everyday activities. We all know that we use repeated movements and prolonged postures. You want to call them exercises. You want to call them just activity all day long. We use it therapeutically to increase joint flexibility. We do stretching to increase muscle length. We do strengthening exercises and we give people overload so that their muscles get stronger. And we also try to train people to move differently. And in athletics, they try to train you how to have the right form for athletics. So that's not a, an unusual thing to think about how we use movement to change tissue. One study example is uh, many years ago, Klaus and Bullock Saxton did a study where they looked at the lumbar and pelvic uh, alignment in cyclists. And what they found is that in group one cyclists, those who rode their bicycle for three hours a day, as compared to those who only rode for one to two hours a day and controls who did not ride a bicycle, that the cyclist groups one and two had less lumbar curve. In other words, they had decreased their lumbar curve, moved towards flexion, and group one had even less lumbar curve than group two. So they had a greater degree of lumbar flexion in forward bending as well that was unrelated to hamstring shortness. So this just says that if you keep your back flexed for many hours a day, it gets flexed. I, I love this little cartoon because I think it's just so perfect for, for the profession. You've got athlete's feet, tennis elbow, runner's knee, and swimmer's cramp. What you need is exercise. And I think that's exactly the case, is what the therapeutic exercise should do is correct all of those little 
tissue adaptations and movement faults that were induced by this activity. So we're going to talk about the specific tissue adaptations induced by these movements and postures of everyday activities. We'll, we'll deal a little bit at first with joint flexibility and degenerative changes, and then muscle factors, skeletal, neural, and a bit about biomechanics. So first, let's talk about joint flexibility and degenerative changes with just a couple key slots. Now, to redefine relative flexibility, we have two forms. Intrajoint, which means that the accessory motion itself has developed micro-instability, and that's usually in a specific direction. Interjoint re relative flexibility means motion occurring at one joint that should occur more readily at another joint. And we've already talked about examples in relation to the low back versus the hip. Well, here was a study done on the cervical spine many years ago by uh, Kevin Singer. And, and what he did was he had two young men, and um, he took an x-ray where they were in their natural position, and then he had them do a, a chin tuck. And then he looked at the sagittal translation during that motion. Now, one of the young men had had a, uh, a restricted uh, motion at C5, C6. So you can see that that motion is a little bit less. Then, uh, and that was the, the one with the light stippling bars. But when you look at C4, C5, you see the one that had restricted motion at C5, C6 had more than twice the motion at C4, C5. Now, I believe that's the one that's really going to hurt. And you can see the other fellow without a restricted spinal segment had uh, pretty well uh, evened up motions except at C6, C7, C2, C3, which is to be expected. So here's the uh, another study by Kevin Singer. And this was uh, a pattern of degeneration of the cervical disc. So they looked at the disc in 20 cadavers. And they classified the discs as to whether they were still normal, mildly degenerated, moderately degenerated, or severely degenerated. And what do we see? What are the most degenerated segments? C5, C6, C4, C5, and then C6, C7. And this is consistent with the fact that these are the segments that most consistently develop pain problems, the earliest, and they're the ones that move the most in range and in frequency. And so they wear out the fastest. We know in the lumbar spine, that's L4, L5, and L5, S1. So with spinal hypermobility or instability, we believe it's degenerative instability and that back pain is exacerbated by movement and associated with this intersegmental movements that are abnormal or excessive at one or more spinal levels. And this work has also been done by uh, Adams and Dolan. And it says the intervertebral discs provide most of the spine's intrinsic resistance to small movements. And disc degeneration is widely associated with segmental instability. So this is just making a case that instability or hypermobility of the spinal segments is really a cause of degeneration. Okay, now what about muscle? What are those adaptive changes? And one of the ones we think keeps taking on more and more importance is, is muscle stiffness. And what we're talking about here, and I know there are many ways that it can be uh, accurately discussed, but what we're talking about here is the passive stiffness of muscles in active tissue. So um, this can be defined as the change in tension per unit strength change in length. And this is actually a very normal property of muscle. An important point is it's highly correlated with muscle size, as we'll, we'll show you, the, the meaning that the bigger the size, the greater the stiffness, which is what this arrow means on this curve that often represents muscle stiffness. As you stretch a muscle, you get increasing resistance to that stretch. And the point being that our daily activities and even our fitness activities don't always induce the same amount of stiffness of muscles across the joint. So one muscle can hypertrophy more than another muscle, and this creates one of these paths of resistance. For example, if we just consider that the width of these arrows represents the stiffness of the musculature, if the abdominal muscles are really stiffer than the hip flexor muscles are, that will tend to posteriorly tilt the pelvis. 
if the abdominal muscles are not as stiff as the hip flexor muscles, then the passive tension from the hip flexor muscles will pull the pelvis into an anterior. This is another example of, of the simple ways that we see in the clinic all the time of what I call inner joint relative flexibility and the relative stiffness factor. So this woman is holding one knee to her chest, as you can see from the video, and I'm monitoring her ASIS of the right lower extremity. Now, as she slides her right hip into extension, my right thumb moves forward with her ASIS, so that almost immediately on beginning to extend her hip, her pelvis is going into an anterior tilt, even though she's holding one knee to her chest, which is supposed to stabilize the pelvis. What this clearly means to me is that her lumbar spine is too flexible and it's immediately allowing her pelvis to anteriorly tilt. Now, it's a relative stiffness problem because what it also says is that her abdominal muscles and the stiffness of her other spinal tissues are not enough compared to the just the passive tension of her hip flexor, which is pulling on her pelvis as she slides her hip in extension. And just to contrast that, in the years of testing people, I've also found people who, when they extend their hip, their pelvis doesn't tilt, but their leg stays in the air. So in this incident, the hip flexor is short, but it doesn't cause the anterior pelvic tilt. And a question I was always bothered by is, why would that be? Why in some people when a muscle is short or even not even short that there's a compensatory motion at the pelvis while the other one, the pelvis doesn't move? Well, again, it can be explained by both the difference in the relative flexibility of the lumbar spine and the relative stiffness of the musculature about those joints. So, and why is it important? Because in a multi-segmented system, Movement occurs at the segment with the least resistance and the greatest relative flexibility. So if the joint is really flexible and the muscles are also relatively stiff, the body is going to take the path of least resistance, and this contributes to the development of interjoint relative flexibility and a compensatory movement in a specific direction. I love this little cartoon because it talks about the path of least resistance. So Garfield's laying down here and he decides he might as well sit up. And so what moves? His lower extremities move because that's the path of least resistance compared to the rest of his build. Okay, and now here's another everyday clinical example. So if we consider we have three men prone and we flex their knee. And Mr. A, I've passively flex his knee, he gets full knee flexion, and nothing else happens. Mr. B, he flexes his knee, it stops at 90 degrees, and nothing else happens. Except that the knee stops, and that means that his rectus femoris is short, but there's nothing happening at his pelvis or his lumbar spine. In contrast, we have Mr. C, and we passively flex his knee, and what happens when we passively flex it? He goes into an anterior tilt and his lumbar spine flexes. Now my explanation for this for many years was his rectus femoris was short and that's why his pelvis tilted. As we stretched the rectus femoris, it pulled on the pelvis. But I had many patients which if I just prevented the anterior pelvic tilt, they, should, they went ahead and flexed their knee through the full range. If their short rectus femoris was causing the tilt, then the knee should not have gone through the full range when I stabilized the pelvis. So that being as swift as I am, and I thought about this for a mere 15 or so years, I finally decided uh, the imp implications of this are that Mr. C has to stiffen what gives too easily and stop the flexibility of his back. Stretching his rectus femoris is not going to change the relative flexibility between th these two muscles, nor will it stop and change the flexibility of his spine.
Now, this young woman was uh, ranked 32nd in our country as a gymnast at one particular time, and like all good gymnasts, she had multiple musculoskeletal pain problems, including low back pain. And you can see in this picture with her knee flex, she has marked lumbar extension. Now, if we prevent her pelvis from anteriorly tilting, this was all the knee flexion that she had. So that means her rectus femoris was so short that even slight knee flexion was causing a anterior pelvic tilt and hip flexion. Now I, I propose that actually if her pelvis didn't tilt so readily that she would have never gotten this short erectus femoris because her muscle would have been taken through the full range every time she flexed her knee rather than just her back being moved and her hip being moved as she flexed her knee. So again it brings up the point that what's important to this is that she has to stiffen her abdominals so that stiffness matches that of her rectus femoris and anterior thigh muscles. So what are the sources of passive muscle stiffness? Well, they're really the structural proteins. Titan, by name, are also called connectin. The other factors that we've learned are the extracellular matrix, the endromesium, paramecium, epimesium, coverings of muscle and muscle bundles. And what we have learned from the studies of Rick Lieber and his colleagues is that when we're talking about whole muscles as compared to muscle fibers or muscle bundles, is that it's the collagen that develops in whole muscle and tendon that accounts for most of the passive stiffness. Another factor is the weak binding of actin and myosin, which is called thixotropy. I, I do not believe that the actual tension from this is uh, significant enough that we can detect it easily nor is it of uh, very long duration. This is the kind of binding that if you kind of shake your muscles a little bit, you, you change the thixotropy and you break the binding. It's like shaking ketchup that doesn't uh, uh, flow easily until you shake it up. So just to give you an idea of what Titan's all about, it is actually a very large, I believe it's almost the largest in, uh, protein that we have in the body. It's an intracellular protein, and it uh, holds myosin onto the Z-line. So this is a diagram of, of Titan connecting myosin onto the Z-line. And there are six uh, Titans for every myosin filament. So that means when you hypertrophy your muscle, you significantly increase the amount of, of Titan. So... Hypertrophy increases muscle stiffness by increasing the numbers of sarcomeres in parallel and then the numbers of these structural proteins. That means we really increase the amount of titan. We also increase the amount of collagen and the extracellular matrix. So the result is an increased resistance through the range of motion. One of the studies that demonstrated this was done by Gary Klebon and his colleagues, and Gary is actually a physical therapist at the University of Iowa. He was doing this study for different reasons than we're discussing here. But he looked at the passive tension of the elbow flexors of uh, males and females. And this is the torque an angle curve and that you see as you uh, passively elongate the elbow flexors of a male, the passive tension increases more rapidly and to a much greater extent than in a female. And in this study, what they also did was have people lift weights to try to hypertrophy their muscles. And then they looked at the correlation between muscle volume, which is the bars with the crosshatch, and the open bars, which is the muscle stiffness. And what you see is there was a very high correlation between the volume of a muscle and its passive tension. So the bigger a muscle is, the stiffer it is. Now that does not mean that all people have the same amount of stiffness given a, a certain amount of muscle volume because there are variations in people's collagen, etc. But it does mean that if you have a hypertrophied muscle, that muscle is going to be stiffer than your muscles that are not hypertrophied. Now why is this important? I, I think the thing is it's, it's such a wonderful design of the body that you have 
reward for your work when you're inactive as you have when you're active. So what do I mean by that? Actually, to, to make the point with a story is I, I had a colleague in New Zealand who did some studies of people when they were uh, walking, and he looked at how much the abdominal muscles were active. And much to my disappointment, it, the abdominal muscles are only working 10 to 12 percent when you're walking at a normal rate. It's like, oh, who cares? But then when you think about it, wow, that's a really good design. Because if the muscles went off 90% every time you took a step, you would be exhausted walking down a long hallway. So instead, if you have hypertrophied your muscles and you have a lot of passive tension, your trunk and pelvis is under control by these passive segments, passive tension rather than by having to contract the muscles. And in fact, if the muscles are all elongated and have no passive tension, even if you contract them 100%, they're not going to deliver much effective tension to the parts to which they're attached. On the other side of the coin, and I think it's important to realize this, that there's such an emphasis on core strengthening these days that I have seen people who have increased or are generated their back pain by the passive tension of their abdominals it gives them what I call, kind of, um, to make a vivid impression, squeeze-o, smash-o. So that the, the vertical compression from the abdominal muscles is enough to increase the compression on their spinal segments. Now, how do I know that? I know it because if I take those individuals and I passively lift their trunk. Now, I'm not lifting them off the floor. This is no major, major stretching phenomena, just unloading their trunk a bit. In fact, we have a paper published this way. Their symptoms go down. If I have them put their arms up over their head and take a deep breath about eight times, and I help elongate their rib cage and their trunk as they do that, when they stop, their symptoms decrease. So you can have too much tension and you can have too little tension. I always say that's why they need us as physical therapists to make sure that everything's working optimally and nothing's excessive and nothing nothing is missing. So here's an example of really overdevelopment of the abdominal muscles. This this young man indicated to me that he has not been doing any specific abdominal exercises for at least 10 years and the last time he did abdominal exercises was when he played football. Now you can see from the definition of these muscles that they are indeed well developed. But if we look at them sideways, we get a hint out of why they're so developed, even though he's not doing specific exercises. As you can see from these pictures, he has very broad shoulders, and he's also slightly swayed back. So what that means is his abdominal muscles are actually his anti-gravity muscles. His shoulders are behind his line of gravity, therefore his abdominal muscles are working to hold him up. If he tries to really straighten up and lift his chest, then you can see this definition of the external obliques very vividly, and it actually increases his posterior pelvic tilt. So these muscles are constantly working, and what muscles are not working on this young man are his back extensors and even his gluteal muscles have poor definition. So how your muscles are in relation to the line of gravity is extremely important, and we sort of made this point before. This young woman also has abdominal muscles that are stiffer than her thoracic back extensors. She was a swimmer, and if you think about it, you try to think about what strokes would possibly give uh, a person a thoracic hyphosis, and it's actually the abdominal muscles. And the strokes are the butterfly and the breaststroke. Now often people think, oh, that must be coming from the pectoral muscles because you use your arms so much with those two strokes. But actually, shortness of the pectoral muscles would not cause a thoracic kyphosis. They do cause anteriorly tilted shoulders, 
but they don't cause a thoracic kyphosis. But, and then I like to say, well, you know, if you had short pectoral muscles, would you rather have good abdominals or bad abdominals? And if you're thinking about your shoulders, you're going to immediately say bad abdominals because that means when you lift your arms up over your rib cage, uh, over your head, your rib cage will elevate because your abdominals won't be holding them down. If you have really good abdominals, when you lift your arms up, your rib cage can't elevate because the attachments of the pectoral muscles are being held down, and so the consequence will be you can't posteriorly tilt your scapula. So with this young woman, we, we sent her home. We, these pictures uh, on your left were taken in May. We sent her home for three months. She was one of our students and said, stay out of the water and lay in the sun. So she did come back with a very nice tan and a decreased thoracic kyphosis. So while she was staying out of the sun, out of the water, she was putting her arms up overhead, taking a deep breath, also keeping her back flat. And she did thoracic side bends, avoiding lumbar motion, but limiting her side bends to primarily stretching her thoracic rib cage. And as you can see, it markedly decreased her thoracic kyphosis. Another example is, uh, can be taken from the back extensors. So this picture shows you the musculature of the erector spinae of the back. And as you can see from the picture, the muscle cells themselves begin to diminish as you get to the level of the iliac crest, and then you just have fascial attachments. Well, what that means is that when you're going to move, you're going to move the easiest where the fascial attachments are rather than where the muscle cells are if they're hypertrophy. So in this young man, he has very hypertrophied erector spinae, and when he's side bending, you can see he's moving up here where this little crease is. That's actually the level of his iliac crest. He has what we call a tall pelvis. But his whole spine seems to be staying a bit straight, except for this point right here where he's uh, uh, side bending. Now, if we block him, if one of my colleagues puts her hand right at the level of his iliac crest, you can see now he gets a little motion from all of this spinal segment because we've changed the path of least resistance. Now, some people might call this uh, mobilization with movement, but I would call it stabilization. And actually, we're both right. By stabilizing him at the point where he moves the easiest, we're mobilizing his other tissues so he's moving more where he should be. Okay, now that we've talked about muscle adaptations in relation to stiffness, let's consider another adaptation that we believe is important and plays a role in these musculoskeletal pain problems, and that's muscle length. And we call this length-associated changes. And the idea here is that muscles maintained in a lengthened position add sarcomeres in series and that shifts the length tension curve to the right. And we'll show you how in our manual muscle testing, these muscles can test weak when they're tested at their short length. And the standing posture is to give you that idea. So if she's standing in hip adduction, that will lengthen her hip abductors, and they will become too long and not functioning optimally for maintaining the segments in all the right alignments and use, as we will show. So, uh, for example, here's this young uh, student standing in this exaggerated anterior tilt but yet swayed back posture. Now, I, I think one of the first things that occurs to you is like, well, what are her activities? What sport would have done this to her? And you probably don't have to think real long to come up with the idea. She was probably a gymnast. And she would have been classified as what they call a power gymnast because she has larger shoulders as compared to the little straight line skinny types of, of gymnast. And I, and I think one of the key questions is, why does she stand this way? In fact, why does anybody stand the way they stand? 
Well, there's a key physiological phenomena that determines the way you stand. And that is minimum energy expenditure. So when we stand, we try to minimize the, the muscle energy that we're expending. In fact, I, I, this point came home to me so strongly many years ago. Uh, I was asked to go up and take a look at a young woman who was working out on a treadmill because she was going to have a lung transplant. And they used to exercise them as, as much as possible prior to the transplant so that they would be in optimal condition. And so I went up there, and there she was walking on the treadmill in this very swayback posture. So I just kind of said, uh, almost flippantly, um, well, just stand up straight. Don't sway like that. And as soon as she did, her respiration rate doubled. That was such a, a eye-opening experience to see how much more energy it took her to stand where she was standing erect using her muscles. Now, obviously, her condition was compromised, but it was still a real vivid impression. So we all do that. We all minimize our energy expenditure, so we stand on as much passive tension as possible. I think another key question is, OK, if we wanted to correct her alignment and have her stand perfectly, what command would we give her? What would we say to her to correct this alignment? I would tell her, contract your abdominals. And I want her to really contract her abdominals so that she goes out of this anterior pelvic tilt and would also stop the sway back. Now, when you think about it, if you say, OK, if she contracts her abdominals, what happens to the length of a muscle when you contract it? That's right, it gets shorter. What happens to the tension when you actively contract it? It increases. So by shortening her abdominal muscles and increasing the tension, she has corrected her posture. Now, and also taken her out of back pain. Now, that condition which she's producing actively will be the cure when it is passive. And how can we make it a passive condition? By shortening her abdominals and increasing their passive tension. Another question you have to ask yourself is, are her hip flexors pulling on her pelvis when they're not active? Are they not short? And the answer is yes. And that relates to the stiffness that we were talking about before. A muscle has passive tension. And what this shows you is that the passive tension from her hip flexors is greater than the passive tension from her abdominals for her to have the ideal alignment. The abdominals have to be elongated to reach the right tension. And also by swaying back like this, she's actually making her rectus abdominis and I think even her internal obliques a little bit active because they have to work a little bit against gravity. That the key muscle group that's not doing its thing as optimally as it should are the external obliques and the actual length of the rectus abdominis itself. I also like to point out how clever the body is. That by swaying back like this, her shoulders are behind her hips. Now if you look carefully, you can see that she's got marked definition of her back extensors. But then if you say, in this position, are her back extensors active? And I'd have to say, no, they aren't active, or they're not very active anyway, because her line of gravity is behind, is so far behind her. So, and that's probably a really good thing. And why is it a good thing? Because back extensors attaching to the pelvis tilt the pelvis anteriorly. Therefore, her poor abdominals would really be working hard because they'd be working against not only the hip flexors pulling her to an anterior tilt, but also the back extensors forcing her into an anterior tilt. So what's important to realize is that when you give her this command to contract your abdominals and she appropriately posteriorly tilts her pelvis and correct her posture,
that's like a major resistive exercise for her abdominal muscles. And, and that's the kind of exercise she needs to do to correct this alignment. So what are the impairments here? Her abdominals, are they really weak? I don't think they're really weak. In a gymnast, it would be hard to find really weak abdominals. But they are too long, and they are not stiff enough. Her hip flexors, well, I'll show you shortly, they aren't short. They're just stiff. Her lumbar spine extensors, I don't think they're short, but they too are somewhat stiff, and their action causes an anterior a pelvic tilt. So if we go on and we look at her, indeed she can correct her alignment. Sh she can contract her abdominal muscles enough to have her hips completely extended. Now this is a major exercise for her. And, and I just want you to consider the importance of the appropriate exercise. For example, would it be good to send her to a Pilates class where she did a lot of bilateral hip flexions with straight leg raises? No, that would be a disaster. It would be a disaster because her legs have to weigh a ton because it's all muscle. And that muscle makes the, the legs very heavy. <laughs> I might say this, this is where I always think how nice it is just to have cellulite because it's not stiff and it's not heavy. It's just a little bit unsightly. But she's got heavy legs with big muscles. So that makes that exercise of straight leg raises a very big hip flexor exercise. We do not want to increase the tension in her hip flexors. Would we put her on a Swiss ball and having her do trunk curls? No, because trunk curls aren't exercising the right muscle. Trunk curls would only have her work the internal oblique, it may work the rectus abdominis, but the problem is it wouldn't be at the right length. And if she only did a trunk curl, she wouldn't be working against the, the action of the hip flexors. So I would be supplementing her, just standing and contracting her abdominals with, she could use uh, arm weights like lat pull downs or diagonals with her arms while contracting her abdominal muscles so that she's working against the tension from her back muscles, she's working against the tension from her hip flexors and using her abdominal muscles at the right length. So that's, to me, the most appropriate treatment for her. And she needs to understand that she's got to work at it. She's got to try to use the right posture. I, I've learned over the years that, that this has to do with you get what you trained. Her back muscles are trained in a lot more they're kind of the go-to muscles as compared to her abdominal muscles. And she needs to get them trained in. She needs to have them activated readily and appropriately. It's not just a matter of strengthening them, but that strengthening helps to get them trained in. That, to me, is what is important in her exercise. Now, what's the evidence for muscles getting too long? Well, most of it's from animals. Uh, quite honestly, and it has not been well demonstrated in people, as we'll show you. And the classic studies were done by Williams and Goldsmith uh, now more than 30 years ago. And when they took little mice and they immobilized them in cast uh, at the ankle for about three, three weeks at a time. And then when they took the cast off three weeks later, in some of the animals, and these were adult animals, they looked at the number of sarcomeres in the muscle fibers. And, and what they found is in the muscle maintained in a lengthened position, it added sarcomeres in series as compared to the control muscle, the animal in which there was no casting done. So clearly, maintaining a muscle in a lengthened position increased the number of sarcomeres. Now, they also looked at the uh, physiological adaptations, not just the anatomical ones, and they did active and passive length tension curves. So for this part of the experiment, what they did was um, take the muscle out of the animal, they hooked it on a strain gauge with the nerve still intact, and they 
stretch the muscle through different lengths and as they put it at a different length they stimulated the nerve to see how much tension was, was uh, generated. So I enlarged one of these figures so we could see this more clearly. And the, the closed circles represent the active and the passive tension curves of uh, a control animal and a muscle maintained in a lengthened position. The cross hatches represent the length of the muscle in the, in the animal. And, and what you see here is that the length tension curve is shifted to the right. So what that means is that if you put the lengthened muscle and a control muscle at the same position, one's not going to be stretched as much as the other one's going to be stretched. And when you stimulate those muscles, the tension generated in the lengthened muscle is not going to be as great as the tension generated in the control muscle. And what is the explanation for that? What you have to think about that is if you wanted to test the gluteus maximus and rule out the hamstrings, what you do is flex the knee because in the hamstrings when you flex the knee and the hip is extended, the filaments are so overlapped in the muscle that it cannot generate the mechanical tension. So if you have a muscle that's added sarcomeres in series, when you put that muscle in a uh, longer length, in, in, in a test position, its filaments are more overlapped than the control muscle. And yet you see here it's not weak because it actually can generate greater tension than the control muscle. So just to show you the adaptation thing is that uh, little sarcomeres that make up the muscle fiber uh, have their actin and myosin and the myosin cross bridges. And the Z lines make up the boundary of, this, of the sarcomeres. And a sarcomere is just the, the, what constitutes the myofibrils in, in muscles. It's the basic unit. And that this distance from Z line to Z line is rather fixed in different muscles. Uh, in fact, most human muscles is probably closer to 2.7 than it is to 2.4. But the sarcomere tries to maintain this constant position because that's where it functions optimally for this overlap between the myosin and the act. Now, just we're not going to go into this in great detail, but it's here to just uh, speak to the completeness of the ideas that the resting length for, for different muscles varies across muscle length. In some muscles, their resting length are on the ascending side of this optimal force generation curve, while others are on the, on the down slope. And so the sarcomere length actually corresponds with that, functional, that muscle's uh, functional ability. For example, the resting length on the ascending curve is for the wrist flexors, and on the descending curve uh, for the wrist extensors and the supraspinatus, which means that after the muscle shortens a little bit, then it generates its optimal length as compared to when it's maximally lengthened, which you can really understand for the supraspinatus that you really want it to function optimally when your shoulder's a little bit more abducted than rather when it's on its side, at your side. So, in summary, sarcomere adaptation and, and the implications for muscle length that prolonged immobilization in animals does increase sarcomeres. And you can also get adaptation uh, when uh, it's uh, used dynamically in a lengthened position. Uh, if you put a muscle in a shortened position, it loses sarcomeres in series. So, they're going to adapt to get to the appropriate length for that muscle. So what we don't know is exactly what the mechanism is for adding and subtracting. It's forms of protein metabolism. We also don't know over what time period that has to occur. In human muscles, it, you can presume that we probably have a similar capacity, though we don't still know what the dosage is or the uh, change that's required, the, the stimulus to produce this change. The only studies that have been done of human muscle sarcomerogenesis 
was in a 16-year-old girl who had a 4-centimeter femoral lengthening in a laser-off procedure. And the fascicle length changed dramatically uh, over that period of time from starting at about 9 centimeters to a new length of 19 centimeters. So in the vastus lateralis, the number of serial uh, sarcomeres was 25,000. And eight months later, there were 58,650. So this was a pretty dramatic change in a 16-year-old uh, individual. We certainly know babies add sarcomeres, but this is the only demonstration in what would be considered an adult. So it would seem like the mechanism is possible. Now, what about correction of length in muscles? We, we believe that the protruding abdomen on, on this man suggests excessive length of his rectus abdominis in his external oblique muscles. He had been doing uh, bent knee sit-up exercises, and I think they lengthened his abdominal muscles because every time he tried to do a sit-up, his abdomen would distend. It's also reinforced by his sort of wide infrasternal angle that he wasn't using his external obliques, but really trying to stress his internal obliques and his rectus abdominis. And the stress for his abdominal muscles was exaggerated by his very broad shoulders. And as you'll see in a minute, he has a rather stiff trunk. That's add up to, to lifting a heavy load at the end of a long lever. Well, I told him to stop doing, he was also suffering from back pain and foot pain, and I had him stop his sit-ups, and I put him on what we call lower abdominal or external oblique exercises, which means keeping your pelvis still while you move your lower extremities. And uh, you can see the change in the definition of his abdominals, which is even apparent when he's in the side position. You can see that his abdomen looks distended here. He has poor definition. Well, in this picture, you can see good definition of his abdominal muscles. During forward bending, there's one segment right here that you can see is flexed, and that's because that was the axis of his rotation when he was doing his bent knee sit-ups. You can also see how stiff his trunk is. He had some slight kyphosis. Now, unfortunately, this looks worse in this follow-up picture six months later, but his hip flexion is better, and his hamstring length is improved, and the flex segment is also uh, eliminated. He was also two minutes faster in the 10K, which he didn't mind. Now here's another example taken out of Florence Kendall's book about length adaptation. What you see here is, is, a, is a young man who has very hypertrophied rhomboids. And he hypertrophied his rhomboids by doing row exercises, and they were called bent over rows. So he's using heavy weights, and he was pulling his scapula into a deduction while doing shoulder extension. Even in the standing rest position, you can see the definition of the rhomboids, and his scapula are 2A deducted. Uh, the vertebral border of the scapula should be about 3 inches away from his vertebral spine, and these are much closer than that. And here he is resting on his elbows. Now, what you see is this prominence of the vertebral border of the scapula, which is really accurately termed uh, internal rotation of the scapula. Uh, and this is uh, the, the point made here is this demonstrates that his serratus anterior is weak. It's not able to hold in this position. And uh, Florence is now demonstrating the muscle test of the serratus anterior. And she makes a couple comments. One is that for this degree of shoulder flexion, his scapula is not moving to the normal position of upward rotation. And when she tests him in this position, it tests strong. Now, the explanation that I like to give for this is his scapula is not moving to the correct position because it's too long. And it tests strong because she's testing him in the lengthened position where the muscle is strong. As she moves his scapula into more upward rotation and abduction, where, where the scapula should have moved during shoulder flexion, it, of course, increases his shoulder flexion. But when she turns loose of his arm, his scapula returns back closer to this original starting position. Again, I think this is a great demonstration of the scapula is not moving through its optimal position because he cannot 
generate enough tension at a short enough length to move the scapula. It's not that it's weak, it's just too long. So then you have to think about, well, what, how will I address this issue? And I think this goes to a really important point, is that you need to be sure that when he's doing his exercise, he's getting the right amount of scapular motion. This isn't a, a program in which you would just say, let's strengthen the serratus anterior so that doesn't happen. But we have to go about trying to improve the range through which the scapula is moving and have it move at the right time with the humerus. So what I would be doing for this young man is I would have him face the wall with his elbows flexed, put the little finger side of his hand up against the wall and have him slide his arms forward. And as he slides his shoulders up into flexion, I would be moving his scapula with him, imposing the optimal kinesiology of the movement of the scapula and the humerus. And so that we're being sure that the serratus, it's like active assistive exercise, that he's pulling the serratus to use, to move the scapula at the right way, in the right way, at the right timing. Now let's make a point and time this in and tie this in with stiffness. So we could have three patients. And patient number one, who demonstrates this behavior, and I'm assisting him while he tries to move his scapula, and I find no resistance whatsoever. I can easily move the scapula in time with his, his humeral motion. So I would tell that patient, I just want you to think about you've got a string running from your elbow to the little angle of your shoulder blade, and as you're pulling your elbow forward, that string is pulling your scapula right along with it. So you're getting this timing of the scapula and the humerus. No resistance. Patient number two comes in, and I'm trying to move his scapula, and I notice marked resistance of his scapula. So his scapula isn't moving because there's too much stiffness in his rhomboids. His rhomboids are interfering with the movement of his scapula as he tries to flex his shoulders. So in that patient, we've got to not only improve the movement of the serratus, but we also have to decrease the resistance coming from the rhomboids. Patient number three, we go to move him, and instead I pick him up, because as soon as I try to move the scapula, they don't move. Now we've got two really big situations. Now we have to improve the length of the rhomboids before the serratus can possibly move the scapula through the right range. So you can figure out which patient's going to take the longest. Obviously patient number three is going to take longer than patient number two, and patient number two is going to take longer than patient number one, who just needs to learn how to move his scapula appropriately. And as they, the timing improves, the range improves to the kinesiological standard, then instead of sliding their arms up the wall, they can also uh, straighten their elbow out and move the full weight of their arm rather than having it decreased. So here together, nothing is absolute. So you can have patients who have no resistance from the antagonist. You can have patients who do have resistance some degree, and it varies a great deal how much resistance there'll be. I'll never forget taking a look at a young dancer who was actually now a choreographer in California. And she had had uh, bilateral labral repairs on her shoulders as well as on her hips. And when she went to, and she was still having some shoulder pain even after her labral repairs in her shoulders. And when she lifted her arm up, her scapula did not move at all. It took a huge amount of assistance for me to get her scapula to move at all. She had trained during her dance to keep her shoulders depressed and she kept her scapula still and in holding them still all she moved was her glenohumeral joint. Even after the surgery she still wasn't moving her scapula. The surgery didn't address that. It only addressed the glenohumeral joint. So this was critical that we get the scapula moving and she did need 
manual assistance to move that scapula. I have my pa hands all over these patients. I want to feel what's going on. I want to give them guidance. This is like feedback for them to learn how to move correctly. And even though scapular motions are supposed to be accessory motions you don't have to think about, you do have to think about them when they're not right. Let's do the right one first. Now we showed you before this young man right. who had all right this now. Come down, really movement of the scapula. And this is his third okay, visit two months later, up, hold, hold, and hold. you'll see now that really he has shoulder, pretty well corrected oh, his God, movement, so movement fault. One more just to be sure it wasn't luck. Okay, Lift up. here we are with this, and there's no <laughs> internal ahead. rotation anterior hold, tilt hold, during hold. the flexion phase right, now really or during the extension hold. phase. Hold. I mean, I'm sorry, let go he of the shoulder. Learned let go of the shoulder. to turn <laughs> off his scapulohumeral muscles more rapidly then he was turning off his serratus anterior. This was an activation, a timing problem, and he uh, had corrected that by just learning to move with the right time. So when we're assessing muscle performance, then let's put together these pieces of what might you find with length and strength. If you test a muscle and it's weak throughout the range, then it's atrophied and doesn't have enough uh, filaments, enough actin and myosin uh, to ha have appropriate strength. If it's strained, it can be weak through the range and it'll be painful to palpation and uh, it will also be weak. If a muscle is just longer, when you apply resistance, it's unable to hold at the end of the range, but when the muscle is in a slightly lengthened position, then it can hold very well. For example, I'm sure you've tested people's lower trapezius and you put their arm up and they can't hold at the very end of the range, but you apply pressure, it gives about 10 degrees, and then it holds very well. Those muscles are not weak, they're just too long. Now, in their studies, Williams and Goldspink not only put muscles in an elongated position, but they also put them in a shortened position. And the muscles that were maintained in a shortened position lost sarcomeres in series, and they lost sarcomeres in parallel and actually became quite weak. Now, I'm not sure that we have many clinical conditions in which muscles are so immobilized. Uh, I think the, the only one that I could think of where they were immobilized in such a shortened position was uh, heel Achilles tendon repairs. And then they used to, to cast them in plantar flexion after the repair. Those muscles became contractured and incredibly weak and I, now they, I know that they have changed their procedure so that they are now casted with their ankle at at least 90 degrees rather than in a plantar flexion position. And I'm sure the strength and the lack of contracture is well worth the change in procedure. I, th I think one of the most confusing things is talking about short muscles and muscle stretching. And it's really, in my mind, kind of confusing and all over the place. I think. When, when you do a muscle stretching procedure and there's a rapid change in the length of the muscle, it's not a true change in the length of the muscle fibers. This is addressing just what's known as short range elasticity. So if you have, uh, for example, if you're assessing hamstring length and those hamstrings only allow your knee to extend to 45 degrees. So your hip is flexed, you're trying to extend the knee, and the knee only goes to 45 degrees, and you can't stretch it anymore. That is a short muscle. It's failing to elongate to the industry standard greater than 15 degrees or more. That muscle needs to add sarcomeres in series, and that's going to take a while. If you have this dynamic muscle shortening, and 
you do repeated stretching over a short interval, five minutes or less, and you get full excursion, that's not because the muscle fiber has become short. That's because you've taken advantage of short range elasticity or a property called creep. And you'll get elongation of about five to 10 degrees in, in very short order. Again, not a structural change in muscle, just a mechanical one uh, accomplished by changing the uh, uh, elasticity of the muscle, the short range elasticity. So stretching for muscle extensibility, you do the traditional stretching exercise. A single bout of stretching can create a transient creep and this has been demonstrated. Repeating stretching involves appears to improve stretch tolerance but no lasting change in muscle stiffness. So don't rely on the patient's perception of length or, or stretching because as you keep doing it and the patient says, oh yes, it's not, it's not so short or st anymore, it's only because they're getting used to this, the sensation of stretching, not because anything has really changed. So our strategies for correcting muscle length when there's real muscle shortness and you're trying to add sarcomeres in series, you want prolonged stretch, like putting your foot on a footstool for extended period of time, sitting with the muscle uh, in that uh, lengthened position for as long as you possibly can, and really avoiding putting the muscle in a shortening position and making sure that if it is in a shortened position that you're as relaxed as possible. Because if you have a short muscle, you're doing something to make it short. Uh, you're probably contracting it unconsciously in this shortened position. And you may be using it too much, like the hamstrings are being used if the gluteus maximus isn't doing as much as it should do. And as a side comment, I also believe it's much more important to do stretching after an activity than before. It's using it in a shortened position, and then if there's not a way that you re-elongate it, that's what's going to lead to the adaptation to shortness. Um, also, you have to kind of face the fact when you get old, you start to lose elasticity, and there's been many studies that show your range of motion decreases as, uh, as you age. And we've already talked about this man that has the uh, long back extensors and the short hamstrings. And, and in his case, we'd be putting it all together in that we want to shorten up his back extensors while we elongate his hamstrings. And that hamstring length would say he needs to add sarcomeres. It would not be an optimal treatment if you got full length out of his hamstrings in one visit because I would dare to say that would involve tearing tissues to get full elongation in a hamstring that looks that short. So what about forward shoulders? How do they play into this whole picture? Um, I, know, I know it was standard for Florence to say, well, you, your, your uh, lower trapezius is weak, and, and that's what started me thinking about this. It was the question in my mind was, well, how strong do you have to be to posteriorly tilt your scapula? And, and I, I'm hoping that you see with all of this discussion that what we're really talking about here is that for your scapula to be posteriorly tilted, that it isn't just your lower trapezius, but also your lower, the lower fibers of your serratus anterior have to be stiff enough to keep the scapula appropriately positioned in order to offset any anterior tilt that would come from your pectoralis minor or even the short head of your, your biceps. So it may not be weak. In fact, it could be very strong, but be too long to counter the uh, anterior tilt imposed by these other structures. So now we need to cover muscle strength. We've talked about stiffness and length, and now what about the role of muscle strength? This is a young man who had low back pain, and he was actually a radiology tech, and he pushed large uh, equipment through the uh, hospital to take x-rays. Um, it's clear from the picture on your left that he has poor abdominal musculature, and uh, but on the picture on the right, just one week later, he looks much better. Now, 
we know that you really cannot hypertrophy muscle with uh, just one week of any kind of exercise, that it takes longer than that. So I like to use weakness to really mean inability to generate sufficient muscle tension. And because we're talking about primarily musculoskeletal conditions, we'll limit that uh, concept to changes within the muscle fibers themselves, or the muscle cells. So clearly, failure to develop the expected level of active muscle tension can arise from deficiencies in neural activation. But, but, but what we're really talking about is a decrease in the contractile elements. And uh, for weakness, that decrease is the sarcomeres in parallel. And then you have to say, well, what is it going to take to reverse that weakness? What is the required stimulus? Well, we all know it's overload. So just to be sure we're all on the same page, we'll take a look at a whole muscle. And we know it's made up of muscle bundles and muscle fibers. And within those muscle fibers are myofibrils. And myofibrils are sarcomeres, which are the basic unit of the muscle cell, and um, that when you break them out, they're defined as extending from one Z-line to the other Z-line, and they're comprised of actin, the thin filament, and myosin, the thick filament with the cross bridges. And as has been well explained during active contraction, the cross bridges hook up to the actin and pull the actin fibers together, fibrils together, and um, and then increase the tension. And as mentioned before, when muscle uh, is hypertrophied or made stronger, you add these sarcomeres in parallel so that you increase the cross-sectional area of the muscle. So what have studies shown that, that it requires four to six weeks to increase the cross-sectional area using current methods of measurement. But we all know that you can get improved performance long before the four to six weeks, but that has to be attributed to the ability to recruit R2, activate the muscles more effectively. In fact, in, in a study by Mortani and DeVries way back in 1979, in their attempt to sort out neural from muscular factors, they did a, a training study and they assess two things. The open sh circles show you the physiological cross-sectional area of the muscle, and the closed circles depict the neural activation as represented by EMG. So after two weeks of training, the contribution to the change in tension, 20% of it came from the change in the cross-sectional area of the muscle, but 80% of it was from the neural activation. And it wasn't until about four weeks in which the cross-sectional area increase reached over 50% while the neural activation was no longer making the major contribution. And by eight weeks, it was all cross-sectional area that was attributing to the change in muscle strength and, and not the activation. Those kinds of changes don't take place if you do not train. So to uh, convey that pictorially, if we look at the cross-sectional area of the anterior thigh muscles, if they're atrophied, this area is very small, while if they're normal or hypertrophied, the cross-sectional area of the muscle fibers increases in size. And uh, also, as has been shown by studies by Rick Lieber, as well as others, that the small cross-sectional area is associated with small muscle forces, but if you double the area, then you get twice as much uh, force out of the muscle. Okay, so atrophy clearly compromises muscle strength, and the other is strain of muscle. So this woman actually came for physical therapy. She had had thoracic pain for three months, had been going to physical therapy, and this pain came on after lifting a file cabinet. And though it was still three months later, she still rated her pain at 7 out of 10. Uh, 
She was working but had been placed on light duty. Now, what you see here is I put lines on her scapula, and I think they demonstrate how her right scapula was abducted as well as anteriorly tilted. And the pain was in this interscapula area. When uh, my colleague came in and supported her arm and took the load basically off of the scapula adductors, her symptoms decreased markedly. So here she is with her, her scapula, and that was the shoulder flexion. And then six weeks later, looking at her, she did not have any symptoms, and she was able to lift 30 pounds. And I put these two pictures on with a little horizontal bar to try to show you the difference in the height of her shoulders uh, from her initial visit to six weeks later. Uh, and then also, if we look at what happened during her shoulder flexion, you can see the limited motion initially and then the full range of motion. She was also in the right bra and she was able to fulfill her job requirements. So this was a case in which she had weakness of her muscles because they strain. Now just exactly why are muscles weak when they're strained? Well it's because there's either minor or major disruption of the z-lines of the sarcomeres. So we'll go back to our picture depicting the z-lines. And, and then examples of muscle strain. And you can see these little disruptions in the z-lines in the top graph and then major disruptions in the lower graph. All depicting the muscle cannot generate tension because there's too much overlap. And the, uh, the sarcomeres can't interact to produce tension. Okay, so we're going to leave the muscle depiction of what's going on and now look at neural activation and deactivation. And by this we mean alterations in the activation of synergists, uh, sort of an inappropriate balance of activity among synergists, activation of stabilizing muscles when the motion's not really stabilization, and failure to stabilize as well as problems with the timing of deactivation. So first we're going to compare the limb and back muscle activation patterns of two subjects. And this also helps you to realize that when you just look at an individual, you get a good idea of which muscles are functioning and which aren't. Now we all know from the kinesiology that, that muscles from the limbs can control the pelvis as well as the trunk muscles controlling the pelvis. So we look at these two individuals, and the individual on your left clearly looks like he has poor trunk muscle control. His abdomen is prominent, and he's in a marked anterior pelvic tilt. The second individual, though, demonstrates a slight thoracic kyphosis in a forward head. The alignment of his trunk and pelvis otherwise looks quite good. Now. When they do forward bending, the first subject doesn't get very far because he's stiff uh, through the hips as well as through the back. The other subject has pretty good hip flexion, and uh, his back looks is well within the appropriate range. It's just a little excessive thoracic kyphosis. Now, if we look at the EMG activity during this forward bending motion, and then we have a an electrogoniometer on the hip joint, and it shows you what you saw from the real pictures is that the first subject doesn't bend forward very well, while the subject, second subject has a much better range of motion into forward bending. So the EMG was recorded from their left and right hamstrings as well as the back extensors on the left and right side. And what you see with the first individual, he has almost continuous hamstring activity on the left, not quite as continuous on the right, and then just periodic activity from the back extensors. It's a slight artifact in this one recording. There's a very different picture for subject number two. He has some hamstring activity during the forward bending, but then his hamstrings go completely quiescent as do his back extensors. This is the normal expected picture of forward bending. You basically hang on your ligaments after you complete your range of motion. And then when he comes back up, there's a big burst in the hamstrings, but also importantly, a big burst in the back extensors.
so he uses both hamstrings and back extensors to the return to standing. And then we look at them in uh, the quadruped position. In the first subject, he has his toes and ankles dorsiflexed. His hips aren't really centered over his knees, and he's in a slight posterior pelvic tilt, not quite at 90 degrees. The other subject has his ankles and toes are extended, his hips are centered over his knees, and he has a slight increase in his lumbar extension, but otherwise his alignment looks quite good. If we ask him to rock backwards, the first subject doesn't go very far, again because of the stiffness, while the second subject goes all the way back and can sit on his heels with good hip flexion, again just this uh, slight thoracic hyphosis that we see. And then if we go forward, again, a, a, a picture of inappropriate use of ankle muscles. You can see the contraction in his legs of the um, toe and ankle muscles, uh, sort of attempting to hold on, which is not an appropriate use of those. He doesn't completely extend his hips. While the second individual makes, makes a nice full excursion, just as you would expect. So let's see the EMG. Well, first subject, as we might expect, is using his hamstrings and no back extensor. And again, a slight difference between left hamstrings and right hamstrings. The second subject with the full excursion has minimal hamstring activity throughout the motion and has primarily back extensor activity that actually begins when he starts to return to uh, the starting position. So he's... Uh, using back extension to return while the other fellow is just holding on by his uh, hamstrings and limiting his excursion. So what about then during a straight leg raise? <clears throat> How are these patterns? Are they again different? And indeed they are. Now we have a force detector under the left foot <coughs> while they do a right straight leg raise. And what you see for subject number one is that he has extension forces. He's doing hip extension on the left while he does right hip flexion. And accompanying that hip extension is EMG from the hamstring muscles. While our second subject with good uh, trunk control, it looks like, less limb control, has very little hip extension motion, very little hamstring activity. He does have a little bit of back extensor activity. Well, then we have to say, well, if he's not using his hamstrings to counter the hip flexion moment produced by the right hip flexors during the straight leg race, what is he using? He has to be using his abdominals to keep the pelvis in a point. So we actually did a study to, to assess this, and if we have individuals who use their hamstrings and uh, during the straight leg race, then they do not have uh, abdominal muscle activity. If we instruct them to not push down, keep their hamstrings relaxed, then they significantly increase their external oblique muscle activity. So this little study verifies what we saw from the very beginning, that the person who looks like he doesn't have good abdominals doesn't, and the one who does have good abdominals has them because he uses them. They're built into his movement patterns. Well, the, it, there's another interesting example of this. This is a woman who had low back pain, and th the point of her story is that she actually activated her lumbar back extensors even when she shouldn't. She was 42 years old and had chronic low back pain. She was only 5 foot 1 inch tall, but weighed 265 pounds. And her work was standing and packing boxes all day. Now, this picture of her back extensor area, they look markedly hypertrophied. I'm sure there was some uh, fat tissue also in that, muscul in that back region, but also her back extensors were her primary muscle. As you can imagine, she had a very prominent ab abdominal uh, region. And here's the case in point. When she was supine and her hips and knees were passively flexed on a bolster, her pain decreased. If she was able to keep her hip flexors completely relaxed, there was no pain at all. If we used assisted hip flexion using hands to hold a towel under her thigh, uh, to, 
it actually increased the pain. And the reason was that she contracted her back extensors rather than her abdominal muscles. So you could actually almost see her arch her back as she attempted to hold her knee to her chest. So that meant both her hip flexors and her back extensors were contributing to lumbar extension and an anterior pelvic tilt. Now when anyone else would be supine and they would hold their hip in flexion, they would contract their abdominal muscles, not their back tensors. Another example of impaired activation patterns can be seen when people return from forward bending. Uh, so here are three strategies for a return from forward bending. The first is hip extension followed by trunk extension. The second is back extension followed by hip extension. And the third is actually sway. So the individual sways from the ankle and their hips come forward and, uh, and then their back uh, extends as their hips are swaying forward. So which way is the appropriate way? Well, number one is what everyone should do. Number two is what no one should do. And number three is okay for a temporary period of time. And what it really reflects is poor hip extensor musculature. Okay. Uh -huh. Ready. So here's a video depiction of the, the patterns that you have. And the first two are hip extension with return. And here's the second depiction of hip extension with return. Clearly. And the third time, mm -hmm. that's uh -huh. back Ready. extension rather than hip extension. Now we can see another depiction of this in which there's going to be ankle sway. So we'll watch, I'm sorry, with Good. back extension one time. That's and then ankle okay. sway. The hips sway back and the hips sway forward. Hips sway back and hips sway forward. So you sort of use your upper trunk as momentum. Okay. Okay. It, it avoids marked lumbar extension and the pelvis sways forward so that you're not getting a large lumbar Good. extension moment. So those are the three patterns. As we say, the return with hip extension is the most desirable. The back extension no one should do and should be taught immediately how to avoid that. And the ankle sway I actually use with older patients because often they don't have the hip extensors and I want to avoid and completely minimize any tendency towards lumbar extension. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. Now, I, I believe that when people are standing and Good. Uh, working okay. all day long. They don't really go into strong, long, uh -huh. big ranges of forward bending or return, but just do little repeated lumbar extension patterns okay. versus hip okay. extension. Ready? Mm -hmm. So Ready. what you're going to see first is just that's lumbar extension, lumbar Good. extension, okay. now, now. lumbar yeah, extension. Do, now I'll change it uh -huh. to hip extension, hip extension, hip extension. And the only way these things are going to change is okay. okay. by practicing them. We have one more example of um, impaired control. Only in, with this gentleman, it's uh, voluntarily. He, he can voluntarily do the, do the wrong thing. So you're going to watch as he does shoulder flexion. And you'll see what he can do. He is a bodybuilder. He's also a physical therapist. And you see this great uh, serratus anterior interdigitations. And we'll watch from a side view what he does with his scapula. And here's a beautiful display of the serratus anterior when he comes down doing his natural motion that all looks fine. And now you can watch him. He's going to tense his scapulohumeral muscles, a bit his pectoral muscles. And as he comes down, his scapula wings. And he'll repeat that, and we'll try to get a close-up of what's happening with the serratus anterior. Basically, he's sustaining the activation of the scapulohumeral muscles, but letting go with the serratus anterior are the axial scapular muscles.
So here's a return to the normal movement. So we can see that many people don't know what they're doing with the scapular control, but this gentleman does seem to right here. All right, now let's consider the biomechanical adaptations that come from repeated movements in prolonged postures. What happens to these structures? Well, what we're referring to are the static and dynamic factors, the line of gravity, how it affects muscle use, how it affects the shape of long bones and articular surfaces, and then how postural alignment can um, determine the um, minim minimizing energy expenditure, actually a better way to say that is your postural alignment is really determined by minimizing energy expenditure. So in, in this young woman, she's her upper back is swayed back and the line of gravity is falling way back behind her hip joint. So what that does is decrease the use of the gluteus maximus because she's using her anterior musculature to hold her. Uh, years ago when I first started seeing uh, patients with spinal cord injuries we'd have paraplegics and we would actually walk them in their long leg braces and we tell them to sway back and rest on their wide ligaments so that they didn't fall over because we knew if they leaned forward and their hips started to flex they didn't have any musculature to stop that hip flexion. Well, if you lean back, even if you have the musculature, it will decrease because you're not putting demands on that musculature. On the other hand, I've seen uh, marathon runners, young women, usually very thin, who have this sway back posture and they developed stress fractures of their lesser trochanter. And the reason why they got stress fractures of their lesser trochanter is that if you're sway back like this and you're running a marathon, during the stance phase, you're using your iliopsoas to control your hip, and they're also using the iliopsoas during swing phase. So if you do stance phase iliopsoas and swing phase iliopsoas for about 26 miles, it's going to be a crack, because where the iliopsoas inserts on the lesser trochanter is going to be the point of the strut. Now here's another example of uh, how loading can uh, change joint structure and uh, their biomechanical influences. I don't think there's any doubt in the world that this woman has DJD of her, of her left knee. And what this picture shows and what the, the idea of the little arrow is that she has a large adductor moment or a large varus moment that's forcing this knee into more varus every time she weight bears on it. Uh, the papers have shown that the degree of varus will uh, be proportional to the rate of progression of the DJD. And then I think it's worth noting that the, the most common pattern is for people to develop JNU varus as they get degenerative knee joint disease. And the reason for that is that when we walk normally we load the medial condyle of the femur. In fact, uh, when you see these people that have this very uh, bowed knee, what you often notice is that when they're walking, they'll do a lateral trunk flexion to that side during stance phase. Well, in some ways, the reason why they do that is it decreases the load on, their, on the medial aspect of their knee joint. And, uh, and shifts it to the lateral side of the condyle where it's not so degenerated. And in fact, you can use that as sort of therapy, meaning if you teach these people to walk in uh, some hip adduction, so their feet are close together and slightly laterally rotate the hip, that it will reduce the loading on the medial condyle and shift it somewhat to the lateral condyle. Now, the people, only people I've seen with DJD and valgus of the knee joint are knock knees, are those people who start off life with knock knees. And that uh, valgus 
increases because they're loading the lateral condyle of the tibia versus the medial condyle. So what you do to help slow down their pro progress is uh, to have them walk with their feet apart rather than together. So here's, here's a, a woman I actually saw getting off of an elevator and I wasn't sure exactly what was wrong with her or why she was in physical therapy, but um, you can see she has bowing of her left knee and there's something already with her hips because they're asymmetrical. And if we look where the plumb line is, again, it's clear that she has a bigger adductor arvaris moment on her left knee than she does on her right knee. And when she goes and stands on her left leg, the varus increases and the moment arm becomes even greater, further contributing to the stress on the medial condyle of her knee joint. Now, th this young woman also has some varus of her left knee joint, but here she is standing corrected. And so, and how long did that take? Well, that really only took about two seconds when I said, don't stand that way. But I guess, what's the critical issue? What is the instruction that you give her? The reason why her left knee looks like she's in so much varus is her knee is hyperextended and medially rotated. So what I had her do was to contract her gluteal muscles, hopefully also the deep muscles of her hip joint, and that laterally rotated her knee, and then she's to try to hold it in that position and practice standing with it the correct alignment as well as walking with the correct alignment. There's also great variations in body proportions that then also become important. Now when these three women are standing, they all look to be the same height. I'm sorry, th correction, they all look to be of very different heights. The one in the center being the tallest and the one on the left being the shortest. But when they sit down, they're very similarly close to where their head position is. Uh, the one on the left is still slightly uh, shorter. But actually the way this works is the person in the center is tall but has a short trunk and long legs while the person on this end has a long trunk and short legs. So, and the person on the right side is more the proportion person. So the kind of individual that has a long trunk is actually the one that tends to have a greater tendency to back pain and I might add also to shoulder pain because no armrest fit them correctly and they have to drop their shoulders to get their arms on the armrest. Now here's uh, some pictures taken out of Florence Kendall's book in which she makes the point that if you stand in knee hyperextension all the time you get changes in uh, your skeletal structure. So first uh, is the depiction or uh, an x-ray of an individual with a well-aligned knee and you can see that the tibia and fibula are really pretty straight. An individual that stood all their life with their knee hyperextended uh, are bowed in the sagittal plane and when they're corrected what Florence had pointed out in the legend that you can see that the tibia and fibula are slightly bowed. Well I blew this up so you could look at it uh, a little more closely and I could make several points. Number one, in the well-aligned knee the, uh, the uh, surface of the tibia is horizontal and the femur and tibia are in good alignment. In the and you can also note where the patella is sitting in this individual. In the individual that stood all their life with their knee hyperextended, when they make some correction, one, you can see that the articular surface of the tibia is actually obliquely shaped, slanting anteriorly. If you look at where the relationship of the femur to the tibia is forward of the tibia, and uh, also you can see that the patella is sitting down uh, close to the end of the, uh, the femur as well as the bowing of the tibia and fibula that we mentioned before. Well, what do all these changes mean and, and why are they there? Well, as you can see from the picture standing in hyperextension, all the loading is on the front of the tibia. And this is just going to follow Wolf's Law, so the front of the tibia will go away from the compressive forces. 
the patella sits low because the line of gravity is keeping the knee joint in hyperextension. She doesn't have to use her musculature. In this individual, if she lets her weight line go slightly behind the knee joint, she has to use her quadriceps. If it goes slightly posterior, then she doesn't have to use her quadriceps. So she alternates the use of her musculature because this line of gravity just sits so close to where the axis of control is. So I think if you say, well, if these two individuals start on a running program, which one's going to get to see their orthopedic surgeon first? Which one's going to have the ACL tear? Because you can just imagine what the cruciate ligaments are like in this knee as compared to this knee, as well as for this bony tendency for the head of the fem for the uh, femur to uh, slide anteriorly on the tibia. And this is just a vivid reminder that these bony changes, and I don't think anyone was is born like this. They are the result of Wolf's law about how bony structures orient themselves in form and mass to best resist extrinsic, extrinsic forces. Okay, so, so let's put it all together. Let's see where all of these adaptations that come from repeated movements and prolonged postures of, of activities, whether they're daily activity or sports activities. This young woman actually was um, uh, such a, a premier distance runner that she twice competed for a spot on our Olympic marathon team. I, I will tell you she did not make... Uh, she was not selected from the 100 women that get to try to be one of the three that actually get to, to compete. But between her uh, attempts to become a member of the Olympic team, she was uh, asked to run 10K uh, relays around the Great Wall of China. She had developed a knee pain and had gone to physical therapy where she was receiving ultrasound treatments. She actually called me and said, uh, Shirley, I've been going to physical therapy. I've had these eight ultrasound treatments, and I'm not any better. And my relay race is supposed to take place in 10 days. Do you think you could take a look and, and see if you can help me at all? Well, from this view, you can see that she has a degree of tibial varum, and it looks on the right slightly greater than on the left. If we give you a, a close-up view, and we look not only at the alignment of her tibia, but also little bit of what's happening at her knee joint. I think that if I said, which knee do you believe is painful, that most of you would select the right knee. Because when things don't line up right, most often they become painful. She did have right posterior lateral knee pain. And I think what, what this story depicts is some of the issues connected with trying to treat the pain from tissues that are being traumatized, but not treating what's causing those tissues to become painful. And I think if you look at her closer, what, and you try to analyze what's going on here, it looks as though her femur is going sort of anterior medial, while the tibia is going posterior lateral. And then if we look at her from the side and try to get clues about alignments, as well as we'll look at her from the posterior view in just a minute, one, you can see marked hypertrophy of this structure that actually runs from the ischial tuberosity to the head of the fibula, otherwise known as the biceps femoris. If you look at it from a posterior view, you can see how markedly medially rotated the femur is with respect to the tibia. Uh, it's markedly different than on her left leg. And, of course, this medial rotation is adding to the bowing appearance of her lower extreme. And even when she's sitting, you can see that the right tibia is pulled posterior lateral uh, while the left hangs in, in good alignment. So what happens when she stands on one leg? She gets an increase in the Janu varus that was already present. But 
we can ask her to again contract her muscles in the gluteal area and again I think the most important ones myself are the deep lateral rotators and to do that during stance phase to prevent the hip medial rotation and keep her knee in good alignment. I believe that the most important muscles are the piriformis, the gemelli, the obturators, the quadratus femoris. Can I pretend that those are the only ones she's activating? No, not at all. I'm sure she's using her gluteal muscles at the same time. And then what I had her do was practice that standing, walking, and running. Uh, in fact, we walked around the department for about 20 minutes until she could control it carefully. And then I told her that she needed to, to run that way. And uh, if you can see the comparison between her natural standing alignment, what she did automatically, versus what she did when we had her correct this alignment of at her knee joint. Uh, I actually never saw her again. She was able to run the the 10 Ks around the Great Wall of China. She sent me postcards and she called and she said, I know if my knee hurts, I just need to tighten my buttocks more. Now I think these kind of problems are also exaggerated by sleeping on her left side with her right leg draped across her body, furthering the stretching elongation of the deep hip lateral rotators. Um, I did not at the time see any other additional type of work that she needed to do other than correct her sleeping position. It wouldn't hurt for her to do some uh, hip lateral rotation exercises, which I would mainly do by going from sit to stand to uh, take advantage of the fact that as your hip is flexed to about 90 degrees, you decrease the participation of the gluteal muscles as the hip becomes flexed and then have to increase the participation of the deep lateral rotators. Uh, I should also note that uh, th this runner participated in the Panhellenic Games and she came in third at that time and uh, actually was able to do well and the major correction was this little bit of preventing medial rotation at all times. Sit to stand, going upstairs, uh, walking, and of course running. So, so our case summary is she has neuromusculoskeletal impairments. She has activation impairments because she had excessive activation of the biceps femoris which, which was evident from the hypertrophy of her biceps femoris on the right much more so than the left. And the problem with that particular strategy is that if you're using the biceps femoris to be a primary hip lateral rotator, it does not attach to the femur. So therefore, the effect was on her tibia, causing lateral rotation of the tibia, as well as posterior lateral displacement. That allowed her femur to go into medial rotation while the tibia was going laterally. She had insufficient activation of the piriformis, the gemelli, the obturator quadratus femoris. So this is a muscle deficiency, not just an activation uh, impairment. All of this created biomechanical problems of increased Janu varus, as well as lateral displacement of the tibia, and the bottom line of excessive tibial femoral rotate. So, as we've said at the very beginning, it's the way you do your everyday activities because of the repeated movements and prolonged postures. Those things are supposed to cause tissue adaptations. And the longer I've observed this, the more evident it becomes about how difficult it is not to have changes in the precision of joint motion. The, the hypothesis is that the real problem is that a joint develops micro-instability in specific patterns of movement and that accelerates the degenerative process. What we've discussed are the neuromusculoskeletal impairments, muscle weakness, weakness from strain, length adaptations, and I actually believe that excessive length is more of a problem than any kind of shortness. Uh, that stiffness is a real big issue. In fact, that's why we emphasized at the very beginning
both stiffness and length adaptations. Those are the ones that need to be addressed and that we have traditionally believed that muscle shortness caused things that relative stiffness caused problems with. In the neural considerations about altered activation as well as deactivation problems and I think the deactivation is particularly a major issue in the upper extremity and as we've tried to make a point that's uh, associated with uh, enough strength because this occurs during eccentric control rather than concentric. Uh, skeletal alignment can be affected as well as the shape of bones and that's where the biomechanical factors come in and I really encourage you to keep an eye on this line of gravity because it so affects muscle activation. If your line of gravity is passing through your body optimally if you lean forward a little bit you use your back extensors if you lean back a little bit you use your abdominals. If your line of gravity is just slightly behind your knee joint if it goes back a little bit farther you use your quadriceps or if it's slightly in front of your knee joint then you don't have to use your quadriceps. What's really important is to oscillate the use of muscles as well as oscillate the loads on joints and not to be in a fixed position for a prolonged period of time. So I hope by going through all of this material you understand clearly why we think the path of least resistance for motion is a major determinant in what happens uh, to joints and that the things that determine that path are the relative flexibility of the joint, both intrajoint and interjoint relationships, the relative stiffness of muscle and connective tissue. And of course I wouldn't you need to consider that you get what you train. That these are all the things that really help to set that path. And re appreciating that there are many strategies to create moments at a joint or within a joint. And we vary these muscle activation patterns until they become really familiar and then we're sort of stuck with them. We've tried to emphasize how just because you're wearing a muscle doesn't mean you're using it. And that's usually related to how the line of gravity is. And then real serious consideration of this idea that there's no magic in an exercise except if the desired motion is evident. Just giving an exercise for a muscle hoping that it will control a motion I consider terribly naive. The end result of all of these factors is hypermobility and accessory motion hypermobility uh, are arthrokinematic that re really leads to micro instability. That's what causes the micro trauma eventual macro trauma and leads to degenerative changes in pain. I think what's so exciting about all of this material is that it really says that we as physical therapists that can control these little impairments in movement I believe will be able to demonstrate slow down the process of the development of osteoarthritis. So much of the treatment now is directed towards symptomatic treatment or the consequences rather than to the prevention or delay of these activities and these problems. So if you have questions about any of this material please uh, send us a note. If they need to be clarified in any way.